Hello and welcome back to the Not So Fit Couple podcast with your hosts, Lucy Davis and Benjamin Halden. Today we're having a very interesting conversation with a Mr. Sam Logan, who is an ex-Royal Marine commando and served 13 years in the military. We talk and have various conversations today about his experience within the military and since leaving. We are asking questions that you want to know about the Royal Marines and you've never had the opportunity to ask, so we do it today for you. Also, today's episode is kindly sponsored by the wonderful Fabletics men who I've been sponsored by now for one, two, three years. Whoop, whoop. They have great gear. It's reasonably priced. It looks good. It functions well. It isn't a rip-off, and you can get it via the links in the description. However, I will be telling you more about it during the podcast. Also, if you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel... What are you doing? Where are you? Where have you been? There are so many people who are watching or listening who either aren't subscribed to the YouTube channel or or aren't subscribed (laughs) to Apple or Spotify. So if you are taking things away from this podcast, please do that because it means we can expand it. Enjoy today's episode, guys. Okay, well, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Why the Royal Marines? Right in there. Wow. Um, I was basically on, on my way to make it as a pro footballer. It didn't quite happen for me. That's what they all say, yeah. <laughs> Politics and ACL um, and all that. No, yeah. And um, I just basically said to my my uh, my dad and my brother, who was already, they both served, I wanted to test myself like as hard as I could because I felt like I'd failed at my football career. And uh, I was going to join the Royal Navy. My brother said, you're going to be you're gonna be bored. Like, join the Royal Marines. My dad said the same. So I thought, freaking let's go for it. I looked into it. Saw all the, like, the adverts they do and, like, uh, there's a YouTube documentary and stuff. And I was like, yeah, let's do this. <laughs> I'm going to smash it. And, uh, yeah, it was a lot harder than I realized. <laughs> How old were you? I was uh, 19 when I joined. Yeah. Is I that think... is that normal? Is that really... What age can you join from? Is it 16? You can join at 16. If I'd joined at That's 16, young. I would have broken, like, immediately. Yep. But I, I, one of my mates joined at 16. It took him a lot longer to pass out. Like, he'd... he'd he had to get back trooped quite a lot for certain things. It basically Royal Marines training is thirty two weeks. It's gone up to thirty six now. And if you're not up to the the standard every like week or two, you can get back trooped and move back through it. So you could be there for like freaking three years, like <gasps> just training. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the, I was the biggest knobhead ever when I was sixteen. So I can yeah. fully imagine that people aren't if 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 they're physically ready, that mentally maybe they're not prepared to. Make the commitments. I think that's the biggest thing. Even at 19, I, I had a lot. Of, like, I was physically always pretty pretty good. But mentally, I was really weak. Like, you know, the moment we were in... We were in quite arduous weather through, throughout that winter of 09. And obviously, all I mean, you, you experienced some of the training the other day. Oh, I experienced 20 minutes, though. Yeah. Which and, we will talk about later. Yeah. But I, I was defeated after 20 minutes mm, it's just a different fizz isn't it and you add the elements into that sleep you know food being cold wet shouted at told you your your crap like constantly i was definitely not prepared for that so i had a lot of growing up to do that year but so how many years were you in there i did just under five and then i did a seamless transfer into the reserves and did another eight years reserves so like yeah 13 in total. So just for the listeners, can you just differentiate between the reserves and then also what kind of the differences and what the, the branch off is between like the Royal Marine can- Commandos, the Navy, etc. just to, to give that kind of transparency? Yeah, I'll give it a ready go. Uh, basically, well, Royal, Royal Marines, like if you join the Royal Marines, you're obviously full time. So mm-hmm. you're, you know, you're at their beck and call. You get paid, I think, like 24-7, which justifies them. They can call you in at any point. And even if you're on like leave, like holidays and stuff, you can mm-hmm. be called in if, if there's a serious situation. Whereas the, with the reserves, you only get paid for what you do mm-hmm. and you're part time. You go in on like a Tuesday night, a couple of weekends here and there and stuff like that. So you're very much like living two lives. Go um, going where? Sorry, where are you where are you going? Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, you go to the the yeah. Sorry, you go to the the unit or the debt. So you'd go in to train, oh, do your weapons drills, yeah. fitness lectures, mm-hmm. all that sort of stuff. Whereas when you're in the Marines, you're living that. You live on base. M- not m- most people live on base, um, and so they're they're in it twenty four seven. Like we call them camp orphans, basically, where you just live on camp. I was one of them. Like I just lived there. Like and. My gym was on base, my work was on base, like everything. And it was only when we deployed or, you know, went on ups or whatever that you'd sort of 
go away and go to different countries and stuff like that. But you're always with the lads uh, full time. And then, so you've got the Royal Marines and you've got the Paras, which you would say is like the elite of the UK. And then above them, you've got like special forces. So most special forces are built up of the Paras and the Royal Marines. You've got SFSG, which is special forces uh, support group, which again is built up of like majority Royal Marines and Paras. And then, People are going to have a little cry about this, but then you've got like the other sort of like regiments and stuff like that below it, in my opinion, and, <laughs> and, in, every, and in everyone, every sane person's yeah. opinion as well. Like, that's no disrespect to anyone, like, freaking 10 out of 10 for joining and stuff, but that's just sort of like an infrastructure. Uh, yeah, infrastructure. Yeah. Why did you say before? So, one of the first things you said, and it's just come back to me, that your brother and your dad said that the Navy was boring in comparison to the Marines. What? I think that's like, when you're at sea, isn't it? As well, yeah, Is it? yeah. Sea? I've I've done like what have I done? Two weeks at sea. Oh man, it's sea really sea. crap. <laughs> you're you're literally in bunks, like three bunks or three or four bunks high, and you've got about that. You're lying down. You've got like that much room above your head, and then you've got the next bloke on top of you, and it's just like rooms and rooms of that. Like, I don't know how they do it for like they go away for like nine months and stuff. I think that'd be my worst job ever ever because i hate water i hate being at sea mm. i hate being in the bar the bath <laughs> i hate Beth, man. Beth. <laughs> i hate swimming the first yep. swimming lesson i went to i was kicking crying mum gra- dragged me out of there embarrassed i yeah. don't think you'd pass the test though i just you don't want swim. to be near water yeah i'm the same as you mate to be honest honestly like with the marines you do a lot of swimming and training and we're amphibious so you, you know we can come from <laughs> sea land air um but I freaking hate, I hate the war. Mm-hmm. I feel so, so, I've got like, I must have like a really dense bum because I just sink. <laughs> um, <laughs> Basically you got a fat ass. Yeah, I think if you don't learn to swim when you're younger, yeah. as in from the age of three, four, and then try to learn when you're older, it is a lot harder. Yeah. Whereas the Navy appeals to me more because yeah, I used beast, to swim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it make, I'm really good or in water. you just want to be around loads of men. Let's see, in uniform. No. Sounds pretty good, actually. Does sound pretty great. It does, yeah. But no, I... So the yeah. Navy has always been an interest of mine because I like water, but I can imagine a lot of people, unless you can swim or you're very, very confident in water, you're not going near mm. the Navy. Yeah. Which is... Yeah, I, th- I think so. And like, uh, like it's not that they necessarily do tons of swimming because they're on a, on a ship in like the Atlantic or whatever. So there's probably not massive need to to be able to swim unless obviously something horrendous happens mm. um but going back to your your question why, why did they say it'd be boring i think because they they knew that i was a, I, i've always loved sports like i've you know like i hated school i hated i just wanted to move and do any sort of movement like um it didn't matter what sport it was i think they just knew in terms of like being physically pushed the marines was going to you know, scratch that itch of mine, whereas the other services wouldn't. Mm. Um, I think that's why they sort of said to go down that route and, and they were definitely right. We, were your family supportive of you when you were signing up to, to join the Royal Marines? Yeah, like, so a lot of mums especially will, like, be crying. I like, I don't, my My mum was, like, buzzing for it. Cause, like, <laughs> she's kicking you out the door. Yeah, she was loving <laughs> it. See you later. Yeah, obviously that tells you what sort of son I was. But, um, <laughs> like, my grandfathers were all in the military. My dad was military. Three of my four brothers are military. Sorry, the, no, me included. Three of the four brothers are all military. We can't, we, you know, we're quite a military family. So it was just the natural progression. So, so my, my parents were loving it. Oh, I remember being in training and saying to my dad, like, Dad, I, I don't know if I can do this. And he was like, you stay. You're, you're not coming home and stuff. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I'll see you in 36 yeah, weeks. See you later then. When you, because I'm so interested by the training mm. after I only did the smallest snippet. Can you talk to us a little bit about a day? A day. So say if you got up what mm. time do you get up? what do you do in that day because i can't even imagine from what you put me through for i was there for maybe what two or three hours mm. what would a normal training day in those 32 36 weeks even look like a day probably starts the night before so like at 10 p.m or you know 2200 you'll get like your corporal come up with like right lads you've got kit kit inspection the next morning everything's gonna be immaculate um and and bear it like they'll throw your kit everywhere so it's like you initially start with about 60 lads uh and obviously you know uh ladies can join as well now um and your kit's everywhere 10 p.m at night 
you're hanging out and it's like right kit inspection 5 a.m and so especially when you first join your admin your ironing your you, you just do everything slower your crapper so basically you just like go right well tonight's written off we're going to just spend the whole night awake sorting our kit out and so you'll you'll do that and you will do it for the first two weeks especially you you ain't sleeping like you're probably sleeping i reckon 10 to 15 hours a week for the first couple of weeks oh. um that's not an exaggeration as well that it's called foundation um stage it's it's the shock of capture it's what they do on purpose to get rid of as many people as they can uh, to start with because ultimately it's like if you can't cut the first two weeks we don't want you yeah, yeah. Um, so you, you'll do that the whole night and then you'll get at 5 a.m. and it, you don't realize at the time, but it's all a game. So your kit gets thrown. Your kit, your kit could be amazing, but they'll find anything to pick you up on. Like Irish, like an Irish pennant, like a, thre- a loose thread, boom, your whole locker thrown out. Like What do you do with the thread? You, you have to cut it off. And stuff. Did you have any experiences that happened to you like that? Yeah, mate. Like I was, I was crap. Like I was absolutely <laughs> crap. I was like... Uh, pe- people come on podcasts and give it the vigor and like oh, I was freaking crap at that stuff <laughs> I was fit everything else I was used to set and um, yeah so I got thrashed all the time locker thrown out and stuff like that and uh, but it builds resi- it either builds one of two things it either builds that you you know self doubt and you go I can't do this or resilience and like right that little prick's throwing my, my yeah. f- stuff out again I'm going to prove him wrong and I'm going to iron even better yeah. and it sounds really <laughs> chad but that's what you do and then um, you start just getting better and, you know, being quicker and um, you look, also it teaches you to work as a team, like looking at each other up and down, looking at each other's lockers, like, mate, you need to square this away and stuff. And that's what they're trying to do is build that cohesion. Did you get any people that were in there, in that environment who were not part of the team and created friction? Yeah, but they would get, they'd get kicked out because like what they, because the lads, it's a bit like, a, have you ever seen like, the way chickens operate, like they, there's a pecking order, like as mm-hmm. in, that's where the phrase comes from, like you peck people in line and like there's, and and very much that happens, like if people aren't pulling their weight, we call them jack and the worst thing to be in the Royal Marines is jack or, or lazy, not looking after each other, not doing your part mm-hmm. and so those lads get found out like and you know, they, they don't last or they toe the line. Um, so yeah, you get that. So so you have like your kit inspection at five a.m. Freaking, it will all go wrong. You get thrashed and stuff, and then they'll be like, right, you've got three minutes to get to. F- we call it scram to get to your food. You got three minutes, and you're like, there's apps like the queue itself is ten minutes. So we're already seven minutes late by the time we even get in, and then your food. Obviously, you like waffle it down, but you get hurt, you get back to the the, the accommodation, the grots, and they'll be like, right, you asked twenty five minutes, like twenty five minute thrashing, boom, like you wasted my time i'm gonna thrash you f- mm-hmm. the back that time and it's just as a little 19 year old recruit you're going what the heck like but it's only after you've sort of done it you go that's all a game they know you obviously can't get to to food yeah. in three yeah. minutes and stuff like that so you're doing that and then you go to lectures or you know like i think we were averaging far away from our f- um for our from our actual like p lessons about 500 to a thousand press-ups a day in punishment then you'd have like one to two hours in the gym where it's there's only two speeds. You stood still or it's 100 miles an hour and you're getting absolutely like thrashed there. And then you're getting other thrashings and uh, yeah, weight, like weight car- like loaded carries and, and all this sort of stuff. And you're obviously operating on, you know, the night before you didn't sleep. Mm-hmm. And so you're doing that for two, three days and you just, it's freaking horrendous. Like, um, but yeah, so uh, does that give you a, like yeah. a relatively good uh, overview? It- it screams how you'd stay. Mm. As in, I'm listening to you with my mouth open thinking, why? Like, I've got quite good resilience, I thought. What you've just said there, absolute, absolutely not. Well, like, so I come from, I was working in a bookie, so I'd just failed a, like a football career. My life, it, my dream as a child, my childhood group dream was over. I was like, I'm stood in a bookie's with, you know, I was just like, what am I, this is not what I envision my life to be. I was like, if I don't make this, what the heck am I going to do with my life? Like I was crap at school. Uh, everything I'd pride myself in, everything I was known for as being a good footballer and stuff like that had gone, in my opinion, at the time. I was like, if I don't do this, I'm a freaking loser. And I was like, that, I was driven by fear. A lot of people are driven by like, I want to be a Royal Marines commando. I was driven by fear of failure mm. of like, I can't fail again. And stuff. So, yeah. I think all those experiences that you go through are, uh, are great for building and kind of building those mental calluses mentally. Mm. 
do you think well and pretend it's already started to happen sort of snowflake culture drift into that kind of thing where the actual i suppose leeway that the officers have to treat the new recruits in that way is then diluted because mm. there's too much i suppose liberty that people will get now yeah i, I agree mate it's a hard even you trying to say it you always you have to be careful yeah. saying it don't you yeah. but like i know exactly what you're saying and i think i've always said that the areas you shouldn't mess around with these things in is the fire service like you know hospitals the police and the armed forces like you can't have this culture of like um everyone everyone sort of like deserve not deserves a, a fair chance but like every, like there's certain people we require for these positions like and you can't crap around with that you can't because you're crapping around with people's lives the safety of the country it's like if i if i said to you like why is he not allowed to be a surgeon and you go like because he's blind and i'm like oh because he's blind he's not allowed to be a surgeon how yeah. that, that's a what a bigot it's like no that's just common sense yeah. like mm. of course he can't be a freaking surgeon like uh I don't know if I can say that, but, um, but obviously <laughs> yeah. we can't, mate. Okay, okay. Is it, there's, there's a fucking line in common sense. We, we like to speak common sense yeah, in yeah. podcasts, so. But it's like, if you're not, if you can't f cut it physically and mentally, well, what are you going to do? You're going to put people's lives at, um, at risk in operational theatres because as hard as like Limpston was, as hard as Royal Marines training was, you go out to Afghan, it's freaking even harder. So like, if you're going to crumble here and still get away with it and we still, oh, you know, we've got to modi cuddle mm -hmm. you and let you through you're going to kill loads of people in in like ops. Yeah. So for me, I'm just like straight down the line with this. If you're good enough, like it doesn't matter uh, gender, set, like gender, uh, race, anything. I don't care. Like as, if you can do it, I'll work with you. If you can't, again, I don't care what your gender is, what your race is or religion or whatever, then I don't want to work with you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just fair, yeah. isn't it? Well, on that, we, I don't know if it was... One of you two was saying after you came back from that challenge, the, the fitness challenge you two did. Were you saying no females have passed the Royal Marine, uh, the Royal yeah. Marines Commando fitness test? Yeah, I think it's been open now for like two years, two and a half years, and um, not, none have um, passed the full training yet. There's there's something called all arms where you can get your green beret uh, through like um, like a nine week course. Other other militaries do it. I think a couple of ladies have done done it through there, but through actual raw, like Royal Marines commandos, like no, no ladies yet. Apart from Lucy Davis. Lucy's on her way. Like yeah, I'm on my way to the Marines. I I just mm, it it was really hard, and I would be very intrigued. But I'm obviously not gonna join the yeah. Marines. It's just not one of my yeah, yeah. passions. Um. But it was physically so hard. And also we had the conversation that the fitness test and everything you do, the weight you're carrying is the exact same for the girls and the guys as it should be. Mm. Because I think it's like the police test, the bleep test yeah, is different, different for the guys and the girls. And it's, the, why, why they, is it like, different? Yeah. Because if you have a gun in your hand and you're about to be shot and you need to look after your mate, yeah. or you need to carry them as the example you gave, if someone had died and we had to put, you have to be able to do it and it's yeah. not a sexist thing it's you have to be physically capable yeah. which i applaud the marines that everything is the same that thing you put on my back yeah. was so heavy yeah. it's not sexist though but if, if i had my mum or dad behind me and do i want to carry me somewhere if i was injured it'd be my <laughs> yeah. dad yeah 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 Fact. yeah definitely it's um like that the bleep test like the police bleep test i did a video for my youtube about two years ago where um, I did the bleep test backwards to the police standard. I never put it up because I thought like, this is just going to cause like issues. But it's like, it's a freaking joke. Like when you went in, it was harder, was it? It was a lot harder to get into the police. It was, it was, it was hard, but it was still fairly still not... easy to pass. Yeah. Um, there's was, there was a couple of people who failed it. Is it fat? On the, is it you need to get to five? 5.4, isn't it? And there's some it people, might change. There were some people who turned up on the day and were failing it. That's five five, which that's, is which is you shouldn't just even be allowed. Like you should you should have obviously prepped to some degree, and it's not difficult to get up to the five point four if you've put in the, in the due diligence and the mm. time to be able to work up to do that. If you're at a standard which was nowhere near it at first, yeah. What we, so me and Ben applied for SAS who dares wins. Oh right, yeah, and yeah. Got so close to getting yeah. on, didn't we? Yeah. As in we were down, we down to the final interviews, yeah. and then for some reason <clears throat> didn't put us on as a couple. But that bleep test was ten point two. We yeah. had to get two yeah. girls and guys, and yeah. that that was a push. I mean, yeah. that was 
I think it's a pretty good stand up and absolutely not. You moonwalked it. But, yeah. <laughs> but like 10.2, you go, okay, they've got a good base level of fitness. Yeah. Five point, my six year old could do 5.4, yeah. like no jokes. Mm -hmm. That doesn't tell you anything about a person oh, unless obviously they fail it and then you just go like, yeah, you're not built for this. But Do you think it's because, I'm just trying to word this properly, the Marines, the Navy, the SAS, you're out in operations, it's very physical. Do you think it's just very different to being in the police? This is probably at both of you because you're a Marine, you're an ex-policeman. Well, it's in, in the police, you, the, I think the reason why maybe the the entry level is lower because it's, unless you're in certain departments of the police, the, the physical demands daily are, are minimal. Mm. You're sitting in a car or you're walking yeah, on the streets. Yeah, that's what I meant. And the main thing you're doing is using your voice or using your powers. Like, you can't, if you're going into, I guess, the enemy, <laughs> you, you can't, <laughs> you don't do that. <laughs> and, and yeah, you get, no right, what's, yeah. what's your name? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But so, I, so I that doesn't work. I think the I, I have a lot. Of, my dad was a policeman for like thirty years in in London, and I have a lot of police uh, respect for the police. And I think like with the police, with with like say the Marines or the arm or the army or whatever, you'll go away for six months. You'll be able yeah. to decompartmentalize when you come back and go right. I'm in a different environment. Whereas like I imagine with the police, if like you're doing in again, if you're in like certain teams or whatever mm -hmm. it is, um, and you're dealing with like some dangerous people. And you live down the road. That must be quite hard to like mm. switch off, like, and then you know you you're doing whatever you got to do, and then obviously you're in Sainsbury's, like down mm -hmm. the road ten minutes later. That's quite that for me is like I've got respect for that. With yeah, the police. absolutely. It's hard, hard that. I did it in my own area for a little while, and that was when I was working for the special, so I was voluntary. But even that, I remember we went into a pub, and we're we were doing a lic licensing operation. What does that mean? So basically, just checking pubs licensing and is that, that the police have to do that? Yeah, yeah. Right. So we we were doing that, and um, I remember just seeing people in the pub. All my mates were in the pub that I knew, <laughs> all taking the piss, Ooh, rob, robbing yeah. my baton off my robbing my cuss sort of thing, taking the piss. <laughs> I was like, what am I going to do? Would never do that people all taking Marines. selfies with me. I was like, <laughs> and I was like, I need to move. I need to move. <laughs> yeah. 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 So. Um, with so once you've done this training, mm. you've passed tick done yeah do you just then is it called operation you go into ops what where do you you went to afghanistan yeah what is did you just go straight away was it okay right yeah off you go go and fight no what, i i got sorry so what, what you're trying to say is what was your first op that's exactly what i'm trying to say yeah so i um i got quite lucky because it, it all, it's all luck of the draw whether you get operations or not so every lad joined the, the marines especially wants to go and do do ops otherwise you're just training for nothing at the mm. end of the day um i got sent my whole troop pretty much got sent to faz lane in scotland uh basically you work um protecting like nuclear um missiles on like submarines and things like that so it's like this sneaky beaky operation up in in um scotland and so we're we're behind the wire so you're away from civ civilization for like six weeks at a time you have two weeks off, a week pre-ops, and then you're behind for six weeks. So it's like a working rotor like that. I got sent there. But then on our, on the computer system, I had like this weird draft to 4-2 commando that was coming up in the December. So in September, I, I passed out as a Royal Marine, got sent to Scotland. And on the computer system, it says I was moving in December. Now normally you have a two-year draft. So I was like, oh, if I go in... Like, Sorry, and, some, just interrupt. What yep. does that mean you have a two-year... So Croft. you'll be placed somewhere for two years and every two years you'd normally move. Okay. And so like there's there's different um, units all around the country. And um, so I, I saw this on the computer system and now that place, that unit that I was, that was on my, on the computer system was go, was getting ready for Afghan. So I was like, this is amazing. Like, but I was like, I'm not going to tell anyone. I'm not going to go and like tell my sergeant like, oh, have you seen my thing? Because they could cancel it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I just kept my mouth shut. And then a week before I got called into office and it says, and they were like, it says you're going to 4-2 command. I was like, oh, does it? Does it? <laughs> I, I didn't know. Like, I like, already had my bags back. <laughs> and they were like, well, it's too late now. We can't really do anything. Like you've got to go. And I was like, oh, that's a shame. Isn't it? Like, I'm buzzing. So I come into like 4-2, uh, we're getting ready for Afghan. I'd missed the start of it. And I came in late. I was basically a battle casualty replacement for someone who had either uh, like died or, or gets, got severely injured. I swapped. I went out in in their place how old were you at this point 21 
Mm. Young, that seems well, that oh, seems... I see 21 year, year olds now and I'm uh, like, what? I didn't have a clue what I was mm. doing. Okay. It's mad, I not know. Like I'm 32 now, I'm like, that sounds dangerous. <laughs> 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 well, the kids, I need to look after them. <laughs> and the washing needs to go. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas at 30, 20, 21, I was like, sign me up, baby. Yeah. Like, Ready yeah, for it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's what happened. And then went to Afghan with 4-2. Um, and it was an amazing experience. How long were you there for? I was only there for like three, three and a half months, something like that. I was I was really upset because I wanted the whole tour. And then there was one more tour that the Royal Marines were doing uh, with 40 Commander. I tried my hardest to get onto that as well. Because I, I had no, I didn't have a, like a girlfriend. My, you know, didn't really matter if I died or whatever to, you know, my life was yeah. a bit like meaningless to everyone. Whereas obviously now I'm a dad, I'm a yeah. husband and stuff like that. That so. seems like a really awful thing to say though it was a liberating thing because i was just like i can do this but but what about your family obviously means something to your family and friends well they're the ones that sent me there (laughs) (laughs) no obviously like i'm tongue-in-cheek there a little bit but like in terms of like as far as responsibilities go if i had if something had happened to me it wouldn't have been like the end of the world for a lot of people whereas now i feel like i've got a lot more of an important role if i went out now you know and something happened to me. My kids grow up without a dad. And unfortunately, we we did have a sergeant when I was out there who who that happened to, who had free, free, who was basically in my situation now. And I'm like, first of all, what a freaking brave man yeah. for actually doing that. And second of all, like what an incredible wife he had to be able to hold it together, obviously, when he passed away as well. And then, and again, what an incredible loss for the three children who have lost like a rock in their life. I, just, I think of my children now, it just make, it breaks my heart. So mm. like, fair I, play. yeah, fair play. Like I, I was brave as a 21 year old, so to speak, but that's different. That's different level altogether there. Were there any moments when you were out there that you ne- like nearly died or were very nearly close, like cheating death? Yeah, we, I had a few, a few situations that were pretty um, sketchy. And um, again, uh, as well, like you, you never know if you're, you know, half a foot away from blowing yourself up, like on a improvised um, explosive device as well, because obviously that that's a, a lot of that's a way that a lot of our guys died or lost limbs or whatever is like just putting their foot in the mm-hmm. wrong place, like because uh, they the the Taliban would you know put in um, improvised explosive devices in known paths that we would take so that obviously you'd catch it up. Uh, so there's a guy, Mark Omrod, like great guy, Royal Marine. He, he, I think he's a triple amputee. Um, We've been speaking to. Yeah, involved. we'll put a picture on the screen. Sense of getting him on the podcast here. Yeah. So like he's, he's a, a, you know, amazing guy, amazing story. But you think like that could have been me. I don't know how close I was to mm. stepping on one of them. Uh, one, one patrol, I got, uh, we were about to go out the gates and then it got delayed by half an hour and then they didn't need two of us for whatever reason so two of us they were just like right lads you two drop out look complete luck of the draw and then one of our lads died on that patrol so i was like where the heck are the lads like taking ages and when they come back in like one of our lads had died and um just, just luck of the like luck of the draw what was it like in the camp though when that kind of news hits really really somber really somber like um yeah, somber, but but really professional guys, like amazing. I've worked with some amazing guys that you know I'm so proud to have set, said that I've served with, and you just crack on. Like it's prof- professionalism. It's like right, we have got a job to do. Obviously, this has happened, but the next patrol out, you go, and you just have to crack on. Um. So yeah. Was there any other memorable experiences during that tour that you did? I remember the first day I went out on the front line, and I was on like Sanger duty, what you call like lookout. And uh, I think like a 500 pound drop, uh, bomb got dropped a couple of K away. And I've never heard an explosion like it. Okay. Um, and it like rocked me to me. And I was like, I've arrived. Yeah. Like <laughs> flipping heck. And um, I, I always remember that randomly. And like when I, I still quite like quite struggled to sleep. Cause you've got, I think, I think I can uh, attribute it to like Afghan and just my time in the Royal Marines of just, hyper vigilance like you've got to always be so switched on so aware and like we work with like the afghan national army and uh, they they did a lot of um 
they'd have like rogue soldiers working for them who would just turn around and just like shoot loads of our guys. So even when you're in the camp, which is like your safety net, like the PB, the patrol base, uh, you're even switched on then. Like, do I trust these guys and stuff like that? So because you're like that, and bearing in mind, I only did like three, three and a half months. Yeah. Some guys have done four or five tours for six, seven months, you know, and, and now, 10 years later or whatever, we're getting a lot of these issues are cropping up and people are just struggling because it's so hard to, so hard to switch off. We actually, lost, um, <clears throat> one of my friends who I served out there with uh, recently, like committed suicides oh. I think about six weeks ago or so. Oh, that's so sad. Um, and you, so you like... You know, I I look at my time and I was like, it's it could probably be relatively impressive on the outset, but then I look at other guys and I'm like, freaking legends, like you know. So I think you gotta be careful with that kind of mentality sometimes, though, in terms of, of comparison, because mm. what you've also done is is massively valuable, and we respect massively what you, what you've done. And I think you've got to be careful how much you compare to to other people in those those certain situations. But I think it's good that you've touched on the mental side of it because obviously this this week is actually mental mm, health yeah. awareness week so on a serious question like how are you and how do you think your experience experience as in the royal marines has contributed to how your kind of mental health and mindset is today um how am i pretty good like um I always, I think my experiences have helped me put things into perspective. So if I'm having a, a crap day by my standards, I'm going, I'm like, well, there's a bloke out in Afghan who's trying to feed five kids and has got no money to do so. So I'm doing all right in that in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, I I think, um, yeah, I do struggle with sleep um, and being able to switch off and things like that and you play a lot of things back in your mind and, and, and stuff like that. So from that regard, that's always something I'm trying to work on and, and get better at and um, stuff, but pretty good overall. Um, and there's there's guys who are struggling a lot more than, than me. Um, I feel blessed. I'm blessed, man. I can provide for my kids. My kids mm. have got food, food in their bellies, clothes on their back. My wife's relatively happy, I think, mm. like in marriage. <laughs> I'm blessed. As happy as it can be. <laughs> yeah, I'm blessed. In terms of sleep then, mm. is that in terms of nightmares and flashbacks? Uh, just switching off, man. Like, there's not one, there's not like a an event that I constantly replay. Mm. It's just being able to switch off. Just can't, just can't switch off. Um, I do everything. I do all the tricks. No screen time after, you know, five and no caffeine and whatever it is I do, I just can't, can't switch off. Um, and I think that is a trait of like military personnel. Of just you're trained to be hyper vigilant. Like the whole of your training as well is constantly being alert, constantly, you know, mm. and that gets pumped into you for years and years. And then one day you walk out the gates, you no longer need a lot of that stuff. Um, but it's very hard to 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 just just switch off from it, I guess. And when you left, or when people leave the military, Royal Marines, and things like that. Is there anything like doctors or nurses or mental health specialists who assess you before you kind of go back into the real world? Because everything you've just said there, a lot of people get PTSD and things, don't mm. they? Do you, do you get assessed? Do you get a, like a tick that, okay, you, you're okay to leave and carry on normal life? Do you get assessed in any way? It all just seems like a yeah. lot. You get like trim, which I never actually got, but that's- What's trim? Well, I mean, I don't really know because I didn't do it, but it's like basically like you get like a, when you come back from Afghan, you get like some interviews and questions and stuff like that. And I think it's all, all done pretty, you know, the thing is you've got thousands of and thousands of people going out to Afghan, coming back and stuff like that. It's, I think the military are obviously on a budget. They can't spend yeah. like trillions on it or whatever, but they mm. do as much as they can. Um, but you get like trim. I'd gone on another course, so it, I just never it never happened to me. Um, but funnily enough, like I had a, a sniper on my channel the other day that I was interviewing a Royal Marine sniper, and I said, you know, do do you as a sniper get any extra stuff? Because obviously, like you know, they're up and personal. Yeah. Um, and he's like, no, you get the same as everyone else. So from that aspect, I think there's probably still quite a lot of work to be done, mm. um, and and also just integrating back into Civvy Street. Like it took me nine months. For the first nine months of leaving the military, 
I really struggled like and it, it can sound quite it can feel quite embarrassing like admitting this but there'd be some days where I just couldn't get out of bed like and just felt hopeless I felt like I, I'd like lost my identity because everything's like I'm a Royal Marines commando that's my identity and stuff and once you lose that it's like I'm just a normal freaking bloke like mm. and um I really struggled the first that first nine months but um yeah I think there if there were if you really need to reach out there's there's like mm. some really good charities like the, the poppy charity uh, British mm. Legion they've got loads of funding did things like that help for heroes and stuff like that so a lot of charities doing lots of good good work the Royal Marines charity are brilliant we we donate to them every month um but I think a lot of it relies on the person actually reaching out and stuff and sometimes like that, that's the hardest jump mm-hmm. is actually reaching out you know and absolutely and you think these these people have have spent their whole career being tough and hard and stuff and now you're asking them to be vulnerable and reach out but like so I, for anyone who is struggling military or not like there's no freaking shame in reaching out you know i've got a close support network with me and i there's three or four friends that i can cry on their shoulder and, and i will and i have mm-hmm. and um that's so important i think that's important to share anyway because i still think there's this stigma around guys i'm obviously not i'm speaking on behalf of guys but even what you said the other day is it just seems a lot harder for guys to open up you've come away from the marines you're big macho i've served my country mm. they don't feel like they can open up but what you've just said there is you can yes you absolutely can open up just before we move on with that if we can pop those links in the descriptions as well call for the uh the charities the charities and stuff yeah. like you just mentioned that'd be yeah. that'd be great for anyone who, who does need to reach out or does need to speak to someone Boom. that was my sound effect to interject this this week's episode of the podcast to kindly tell you more about the hoodie I just quickly got changed into in the break, Fabletics Men. So like I mentioned, Fabletics Men is actually why I also ran the London Marathon and it's why I do all my weight training as well. It is super basic and minimalist gym gear. It doesn't have logos ironed and printed all over it. It's reasonably priced especially if you take up any of the offers that are currently on, which is if you are a VIP member, you will get 80% off any of the Fabletics men gear. Or you could also pick up any of the shorts I was actually wearing for the London Marathon for two pairs for £24. Again, I'll leave the link in the description of the YouTube video or Apple or Spotify, so you can click on that. If you do jump on there as well, please do me a little favor, and there will be a short quiz on there on how you found out about Fabletics Men. If you can kindly pop on my name in the quiz or the drop down menu, my coach Benji, that would be fantastic. And enjoy the rest of this fantastic conversation. I put a post on Instagram this week, and it was about the, the the just talk campaign has really done a lot of good, I think, for especially guys open up and talk about the things. But the other side to that is they need to be good listeners. Yeah, man. And I remember listening to a speech. It's by the guy who wrote How to Speak and Be Heard, I think it's called. I can't remember his name. I put it in an Instagram post the other day. And he was talking about this imbalance in society around the need to be heard versus the want to listen and even if you look at a lot a lot of the big videos that do well on youtube it's it's all about how to be heard how to speak better it's not about how to be a better listener interesting and that's something something that's difficult i think with the balance at the moment around people talking and then people actually listening Mm. to what to what they're saying and also responding to and it's difficult to be a good listener it's something that we're always trying to get better at as 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 interviewers and podcast hosts and having someone the other side who can listen i think is a big comfort and foundation for people to be able to open up and talk but also ask the right questions Mm. that may be difficult to ask as well yeah it's really good and i think that again comes back to having that small network I, i i don't think we need to throw throw out all our problems to everyone. I'm, I'm quite old school with that in that regard. But having that, you know, those few friends mm-hmm. or that even that just that one friend, that, like you say, you can trust and you can give your info, and they're going to listen. They're going to take it seriously. If you're down the pub with like seven lads and you start, I mean, it's probably not going to go the way you'd planned. Yeah. So yeah, it's really good, mate. Yeah, I like that. Are any of those? So you talk about the close knit people. Are any of them from the Marines, or are you still in touch? 
with people who you served with? One one guy, uh, Chris Shimon, actually his name is. He was like sort of my mentor as a marine. He went he went uh, SBS, like basically sort of like the SAS, but like um, more from like a amphibious side, so like water and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, amazing man, probably the. Probably, yeah, just like a bit of a hero to me in a way, like without sounding too cheesy, but like just a real good, very good, strong character, a, a great listener. And yeah, just helped me as a young, as a young man. I was just trying to find my way in the world. And he's always someone I could not speak to him for maybe six months these days. The moment I go back to him, it's just like, oh yeah, we've got that connection. Um, so yeah, I think it's so important to find people like that that you can really sort of bond with. Yeah, and for him as well, he understands what you've been through mm. because is it quite hard to ex not explain to the people but you're trying to say something how you feel but nobody can really relate um yeah but i i guess that's sometimes a good thing as well mm. is that they if they can't i don't know yeah i i think so i'm just trying to think so i've got two so i've got an older guy in america who i met in afghan who is like a father figure to me. So it's him, Chris, and then um, like I've got one lad who's Navy, Toby Leeds, uh, and then another guy who's sort of like Marines who I can really open up to. So I guess, yeah, all four of them are military. <laughs> I hadn't really thought of that, but... Um, yeah, it's just yeah, interesting guess... to think about it because they can obviously all really relate what happened and what you've been through and sharing it might not feel as you said before, like embarrassing mm. to open up. I was just really interested yeah. thinking about that. And it's good, like, and I'm going to think, I'm going to go away thinking about this, is like, am I being a good receptor of that rather than like, am I, you know, I can give all my problems, but am I actually seeking my mates out and going like, I haven't heard from him for a while. Is he all right and stuff? So that's, I'll take that I, away. I, from... I think it's quite a difficult skill to develop, especially mm. if it's something that you're not self-aware of as well. It's not something that's taught to us. Yeah, I think even being a good speaker isn't taught to people in school, but then being taught to be a good listener is even less yeah. spoken mm-hmm. about. And I think even when sometimes you're potentially having those conversations and those difficult conversations with people, you maybe just even be thinking about the next question to ask or the next thing to say, not really listening to what that person yeah. is trying to reveal to you as well. Yeah, definitely. I think as well, like everyone's got Facebook, post, like everyone's constantly throwing their stuff out. We're, we're in a culture now where like everyone's got a voice um but yeah like that what you're talking about Piers Morgan was speaking about it about it I can't remember the exact ins and outs of the interview but he was talking very much about how people's everyday problems and issues are becoming they're kind of labeling them as depression yeah, or yeah, yeah. anxiety. It was, the, it was on the Stephen podcast. On the Stephen podcast, was yeah. it? Which I, which I thought was interesting because I think a lot of everyday issues and problems are then being labeled as some, something different, which is, it, it almost takes the control away from people to really address it, take responsibility and ownership and then act on it, mm. which I think it's it, it can be kind of a blurred line between what is actual clinically depression and what someone yeah. just label as a an everyday issue that the everyday mother father issues at work what issues with kids may have and then sort of putting a label on it which isn't fitting yeah i had it the other a couple of weeks ago like i had this fit, like sort of weird bout for like two or three days where i felt like i was just like in this cloud of like i guess like i want to use depression for want of a better word and then i got to the third day and i was like right pull yourself out of this now because you're just moping about and i was like feeling sorry for myself and i was just like had no energy to do anything so i just like i was in my car and i was just like i was like i'm not feeling this anymore like i stop it i was like praying against it as well and everything like that and like i come out of that session i was like i feel good i feel good and then like from there i just sort of like continued and like i'm not saying that will solve all your problems yeah. but sometimes just going like i'm i'm not gonna feel like this anymore. like i'm gonna drag myself out self out of this hole i'm not gonna just pity myself mm-hmm. like again like i always use that analogy of like there's a guy in afghan who's like can't feed his kids or a slum in brazil and stuff i'm like i'm freaking doing good like and i'm gonna i'm gonna be blessed with what i've got i'm gonna be um satisfied with what i've got i obviously want to do more in my business mm-hmm. i want my business to grow and stuff but with what i've got right now i'm gonna 
be satisfied with. So that's called mm. downwards, oh. downwards gratitude. We okay. actually spoke about this with Mo on the podcast. Oh, it's where that Mo. you, for example, I was speaking to him about how I was very lucky from a surgery that I had his son died from. Right. And okay. I was saying like, I look at it as I'm very lucky to, to be here, here and alive. And he said, it's a very powerful tool to use is down which gratitude to right. looking at other people's situations and obviously everybody's hard is different it doesn't take away anyone's problems or that they're dealing with because in comparison to someone else's they may not seem as big but sometimes having that downwards gratitude can be a, a real big thing yeah it's really good hmm. but and the other thing i learned from it like similar to you were speaking about then me and cal were just having a conversation even this morning about how sometimes you you can wake up with the feelings of anxiety and I'm careful about the way that I use the term anxiety now yeah. because some people have anxiety yeah. and sometimes you can have the feeling of anxiety yeah. which I think is yeah. different and sometimes it can just crop up and hit you like a bitch yeah like some mornings I'll wake up and feel so anxious for no reason yeah. whatsoever I'm like what is causing this yeah. and one of the big tools that Mo gave me I was thinking about is those thoughts and how your brain actually isn't you and how as I just say to my brain sometimes, give me a different thought. Give me something else to think about because yeah. this isn't what I want to think about. Mm. And that that really helps. But it, it, I mean, that's easier said than done, like you said when you were sitting in the car. But even conversations help. Like I've learned so much from just sitting down, having conversations with people on the podcast more than ever. I had an elocution lesson last week that I almost canceled because my anxiety was sky high. Yeah. Had the lesson, felt great after mm. because it wasn't just a lesson. I sit down and have a conversation with someone and although it isn't about the topic potentially that I'm thinking about, just having a conversation, something to give you something different to think about can often help. And it's like, oh, I feel great. Yeah. And most most of the time, fear as well is like, is a lie a lot of the time. So like you fear a situation or like you're going, you know, with the Royal Marines and stuff. I, I, I realized like, oh, that you know, we have to do stuff like 30 foot in the air and, and stuff. And it's like, if I fall off, I'm like, freaking in trouble here and you'd be playing these scenarios through it and then you realize like this is a lie like mm. I, i'm not gonna fall off because i'm sh i'm strong i've trained for this like and it's just like telling that fear to do one like and just like or fighting through fear i, I like that term as yeah. well just like yeah I f i'm just freaking terrified but i'm doing it anyway yeah do that a lot with boxing like you went I, I boxed at like um, a pro pro and amateur gym in birkenhead and like i i'd know i'm going in tonight to to be beaten up by a pro i'm like i'm freaking going anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean like and and you'd come out of the session like and go yeah man like i overcame my fear humbled in, until wednesday and yeah, <laughs> it happens that again <laughs> i think that fear of the unknown as well though isn't it it can be yeah. like before we walked into this room it could be a dark room i don't know what's in there i'll be fearful of it because i've never been in there before mm. and then as soon as you experience that space you now not feel fearful yeah. of it anymore i i have the experience of when with the with the guns when yeah, i yeah. was training with you and ben oh my god the only time i'd use like a gun what, what gun did i have it that with what did we do water pistol you... no <laughs> what was Super it called the shotgun the other 12 gauge shotgun oh totally the really shotgun clear went pigeon. clear pigeon shooting yeah. i hated it i stopped i gave the gun back i said no really? i'm really not enjoying it like I cried, didn't I? I cried you were a little crying bit. Crying as you were shooting, right? Yeah, you? I was crying, <laughs> tears dripping down, like, trying to hide from the instructor. So when me and Cal were driving over, I was like, "Oh, I've just got the fitness test. Like it'll be maybe like half an hour, and then we'll we'll head off." When I walked in and saw all the guns, I like whispered to Cal, I was "Like, are they gonna make me?" Like, I was like, "I can't, <laughs> like, I can't shoot. No, no, no. Like, absolutely not." I was terrified. You probably couldn't tell because I think I hid it quite well. But then one once I'd learned everything and I felt more confident in myself, I was absolutely fine. It was like hanging off me. It was in my pocket, mm. not my pocket. It was in my beret. And I felt really quite, <laughs> <In your, laughs> sorry, it was not in my pocket. Sorry. It was in the thing. And I Hol felt really holster. quite, yeah, my holster. I felt, I was good. I felt quite confident because I'd learned. And then I knew the fear wasn't really real. Like nothing's mm. going to happen to me yeah. right now. I'm not actually going to get shot at you can do it. I know yeah. it's obviously on a completely different scale, but it was that whole thing of fear. Yeah. And on the other side of fear, that's when you can kind of see that's like true potential, as well. where the reward mm. is. And I just felt really fulfilled. Yeah. Obviously a lot of adrenaline, mm -hmm. really high adrenaline, <laughs> but it was brilliant because I got to experience something very fearful for me 
anywhere and then overcome it. Yeah, it's good. And like, have you, obviously you guys are like you're quite renowned in like the fitness industry, but when you go into a new gym for the first time, do you still get that? Mm-hmm. Gym anxiety. Yeah, what the heck, man? I, oh, really badly. Yeah. yeah. I Even when, so we train at Modified now, it's a mm-hmm. lovely gym. When I go and Cal and Ben aren't there, I still get it now. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I look around and I'm like, oh God, Cal and Ben aren't here. Like I can't. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I get, but I have anxiety anyway. Yeah. Like actual, like anxiety, yeah. social anxiety. And when they aren't there and I look in the gym, I'm like, oh my God, mm. like my friends aren't here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's like uh, what you'd say, you're like leaders are in, in, in the industry, eh? Like, or, you know, like, and so if you're feeling that freaking, like, yeah. 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 But like, do you, when you, when you feel that and you still crack on with the session, you just fight through that fear anyway. You always come out and feel good, don't you? Absolutely. I always say that. You're never going to leave the gym and think, I, I regret that. that. Yeah. 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 Even if you've moved like a little bit, even if you didn't do loads, yeah. you've moved your body a little bit, You, I always say you will feel better. Yeah. And the next time, you're a little bit less fearful. Yep. It's the first first time I made a video and put it online. I was like, yeah. oh, shit. I was shitting myself. <laughs> you look back. I don't want to say that. It's crap. I need to cut it out. And then it was repetition, repetition, yeah. repetition, repetition. Get better, get a little bit better, a little bit better. Yeah, 100%. And that's how you become an expert in any anything mm-hmm. in life is through that exposure. I, I do have to, I don't know if you're going to ask this question. Go for it. And it's also done a bit of a 360 because I sometimes get random fine, yeah. brainwaves. You know when you were training mm. in those 36 weeks and you're scranning, getting your food in, you're doing so much physical exercise on that day. Probably, I don't know how many calories you burn, but a lot. How do you eat enough? You're not really sleeping. So all the the actual health pinnacles that you'd need to be healthy and strong, you don't really have. So how how did you get through it with, or do you get fed a lot? I'm a little fat boy at heart. <laughs> so like I, I've never had a problem getting the scran in. And you've got quite a lot of like, you can sort of have as much as you want. Like it's, oh, okay. Everyone, it's like a buffet. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, everyone always complains about, they go like, oh, the, you know, the food's crap. And I'm like, where were you i really like the food because <laughs> it's just like it was just calories like it was just ca- like pastas and burgers yeah. and and i love it like i i joined 70 kilo because after i'd finished football i was boxing and so i was fighting at 64 kilo oh wow and then it's my weight is it are you 64 kilo? Six kilo yeah i was like i was Same. i was i could pu- i could punch but i couldn't like if like my missus wrestled me i would like crumbled <laughs> Um, but within three months, I think I was 81 kilo. So I'd gone, I'd put on 11 kilo in three months in Royal Marine Training. Whereas a lot of people lose weight, but I was just like, oh, it's free, free food. <laughs> <laughs> Make the most of it. Yeah. I was like, so that wasn't an issue for me. Uh, that was so funny. Weird looking back. Cause I couldn't eat on a full stomach now. I couldn't train on a full stomach now. I'm like, if I eat here, then it means I can train here. I'm like really yeah. particular with like, how, whereas back then you like, you'll scram a massive meal and then it's like, Two hours of fizz. It was like I'm like, how on earth are we doing swimming and everything? Like, how on earth do do we do it? But you just adapt. It's weird. So yeah. on the topic of training and adding weight, do you think there's a prevalence of steroid use in any of like the armed forces, the navy, marines, the army? I think in the American forces, it's massive. Really? Yeah. Why? Um, just the the way they operate. Like they'll we we yomp everywhere. So. Uh, um, bit what you experience with like heavy kit and you just go for you know if we go in if there's somewhere we need to be in th- like 30 miles down the road we're probably taking our kit and we're yomp- we're marching there whereas in the in the u.s military it's a lot more like get the humvee man and, like, they all just like <laughs> take convoys everywhere um they're all like a lot of them are massive guys but don't necessarily do much like cardio with it yeah. but like they can like bench like freaking like 250 and yeah. stuff like that probably not 250 but like up there and um yeah it's quite different but we're in the marines i think we one lad i knew no yeah one lad i knew uh we'd done all like the drug testing she get tested like i think like every year or they try to at least and what, he, sorry what are you getting tested for do you know is it just recreational or is it uh yeah i think any sort of drug like drug drug abuse is not accepted at all in the in the british military you get kicked out so one lad i knew got marched out the, out the gates another lad got done uh, in fact, yeah, I knew two lads who got done for for drugs. I don't know what they. I'm I'm really naive with like mm. steroids and all that stuff. I don't have a clue. But one of them was definitely on roids. Um, but it was so really obvious, like it just ballooned up and <laughs> um, not not beneficial for Royal Marines life though, because you've what the um, 
just the scope of the job like being massive is not beneficial like i'm i'm bigger set now than i was in the in the marines i'm not exactly the biggest bloke in the world but this wouldn't be beneficial to be like a bit a bit bit bulkier and then another lad i think he'd done like coke or something like that i don't know he got done for it silly yeah march me and carl having this conversation the other day about the kind of practicality of it and some people would argue are surely it's beneficial for everyone to be able to take gear and you've got these ultimate oh, I think superheroes. So, yeah. But then obviously how is being able to squat 300 and bench 200 and whatever, yeah. pra- like real practical transferable skills into the battlefield or, yeah. or whatever, yomping and moving around for that long or whatever you're doing. And then the other other side of it is obviously through taking anabolics is your temper and your level control and your anger levels for someone holding mm. A you firearm isn't, isn't going to be uh, shaky. Well, it's not. It's not going to be very useful. Like, what is it that like? What would Olympians use? Like, what would a cyclist use or whatever? Like, I, I'm literally. They do like blood doping, don't they? And stuff like that would be great. Like, yeah, endurance yeah. based. Why? Like, why wouldn't you give your soldiers on ops that stuff? I yeah. don't know. Like, I don't know what the side effects are, but blood doping. I'll do it. <laughs> I, I suppose that kind of stuff because testing for anabolics and steroids is expensive. So I would have thought th- there'd have to be a suspicion there, maybe okay. fair to do that kind of drug test, whereas recreational testing is a lot cheaper. Well, what they do is you'll go in, you'll be, say, like I say, like a lot of people live on the camp and they'll just close the camp down for the day. All work is off. No one's allowed in or out. And then they just test everyone. Yeah. And also that must be difficult being, being like a roider and be like, you're off to Afghan now. Well, let me just pack up all my yeah, you couldn't and all yeah. my tests yeah, yeah, and my, yeah, yeah, my yeah. jabs. Yeah. yeah. And out there, like I lost weight in Afghan because it is like you're at, like 50 degrees heat or, or up to 50 degrees heat. You're you're literally yomping around for like nine hours on patrols with heavy kit, and you know obviously if something kicks off, you're sprinting and da da da. So like I did, lo- and you're you're eating rations as well, which is crap. So I was I, gonna say, where do you get your food from out there? Because you're in like a desert. And then, and you're in a depends where you are. Yeah, camp. Where do you get your food? You've got like bast. You've got like main. I'm going to use the wrong terminology here, but you've got like your main camps. Like you've got Camp Bastion, which is like the biggest uh, UK camp. And then from there, you'll have like supply chains into like smaller PBs, patrol bases. And then from there, you'll then have your CPs, like your checkpoints, um, like dotted all around. And so that's that's how it sort of works. And then it's all about the supply chain. Um, so you'll get like, I think we'd get on a, every other thursday we might we might get some fresh meat or something like that but we were literally we just had ration packs and you just cook your ration packs i'll have to bring you some as well they're they're horrendous so what, what's what, in, what, what is what, in a ration pack what do you, what you do if you're a vegan or... they <laughs> now have vegan ration packs apparently um wow. yeah but oh my god this was 2011 so i think it was like you're the, vegan. You're not a vegan anymore. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't, don't be a bitch you eat what you give what you're giving <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah. how many ration packs did you get a day You'd have like one ration pack, so you get a box, and I think it was the equivalent of like uh, five thousand calories or something like that. In Norway, oh, okay. when we do Arctic train, I think that's ten thousand <gasps> calories a day that you really? need. Mm. Wow! Why? Because it's just so cold, and you yeah, just your body's constantly. just oh, and you just move like even to survive, it's hard work. So I think I saw a video you talking about when you're doing. Is it the yumping? Yep. How you can burn up to th- five thousand calories per day. Oh, that's, like, that's, that's I'd crazy. say a minimum, mate. Because I did the London Marathon two weeks ago. Yeah, and 6,000. 6,000. So that's crazy that you can do 5,000 per day in terms of energy expenditure. That's yeah. a lot. Well, like, because we were, we were scrambling like, five, our ration packs and we were losing weight on five five k a day. <sighs> oh, yeah. So you would have been probably expending six, seven, eight yeah. thousand calories a day. Yeah. That is wild. So I'm guessing you didn't have your... Uh, yeah, Apple Watch on selling your staff <laughs> count, did you? I had a Sunto watch. You know Sunto? Yeah. And it let me down. So I'm like, I've never bought a Sunto since. Garmin, baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Team Garmin. Team yeah. Garmin. Unite. <laughs> I was wondering that. what your staff count would have been doing something oh, like Oh, do you know like what? I, d- I didn't, oh, I wouldn't have known. Like, so yeah, you like, yeah. Yeah. end on like an odd number. I'll have to get yeah. a few more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you ever do that when you're brushing your teeth? Yeah. <laughs> Well, if you if you walk, would you do like so? You said you yomp like thirty miles. Is that thirty miles in a day? So that's that's the last test we do in Royal Marines training out in Afghan. You wouldn't, re- I wouldn't necessarily know how much we were doing, but you do you do like not you could do like nine hour patrols 
with your kit on and stuff and taking a knee and sometimes you'd like raid compounds and things like that you know like it was just really kinetic and um you've got to show a presence of force like we we're basically saying to these guys we own this freaking area like you're gonna have to fight us to get it back if you want it so you've got to put yourself out there like um so we were just out all day and you know maybe drawing people in or we had tasks taskings or whatever it was sometimes we'd have like deliberate ops like strike ops or whatever um it depended it really depends but uh yeah you just burn in case made like we were all ripped by the end it's good <laughs> <laughs> oh I, f- I learned my first muscle up out in afghan as well really yeah because we had like rings in the compound Did and you? i was just like i'm gonna get a muscle up and, like <laughs> actually got it probably the world's worst form what, what does your training kind of setup look like out somewhere out there just like bastard bastardized like body weight stuff pull-ups and there'll be like some like literally dumbbells from like 1940s out there and a bar and uh pull-up bar and yeah you're just doing like burpees and stuff like that but obviously all day as well you're patrolling and stuff but like this is the this is the really cool thing about the royal marines is like no matter how much you're training no matter how much work you're doing lads will always find time to train like even if you sleep deprived and stuff like it's just that is what you do that's the culture i'm guessing the camaraderie is quite good like if you're all together yeah. training getting yeah, shit definitely. done yeah definitely mate. yeah there was i don't know if you saw this i'm not making this off am i with the thing with the running and it was mapped around one of uh, the camps Strava. am i right there Cal? Story. yeah so that was um in the news a while ago about how strava had the geolocation turned on and a lot of the squaddies were essentially outlining with the route the exact <laughs> checkpoints all of the camps that weren't uh oh. yeah public knowledge um and strava essentially was giving like intel to the enemy wow. on that. not good I'll put that up on screen. That's probably yeah. Sam checking his stab count. That as well. <laughs> yeah, there's one guy who yeah. seems to be in a static location with his arms. But that's that's that seems really bad, isn't yeah. it? They had to turn this everything off. Yeah, oh yeah, there's the in. picture. Yeah. So this was out in I think Kabul. Um, so obviously the Americans and yeah the English people were like outlining the specific places where they were, and it had like you know roads in, roads out. Yeah, all of the words. What do you think would have happened to the person who who done that? Obviously, unknowingly from the, It'd from be the hierarchy. Bad because you do get like uh, briefed on all that stuff. Like we weren't allowed to take phones <clears throat> and and stuff like that. I took my phone, but I took the SIM card out, and then you don't have wi- like. Do you have Wi Fi? Maybe maybe in not not where I was, but like in Bastion, you probably have Wi Fi. Um, but yeah, you're like briefed up on all of that, so that shouldn't be happening. Is there anything that you did like that where you really got a deep rollicking? Um, probably me. <laughs> um, not out in Afghan. I was pretty good. Like I was just Squeaky determined clean. to yeah. be. I was determined to not to be the weak link. Yeah. Um, trying to think. Like I had a horrendous experience in training. Like one day. It's oh, right. horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me so cringy Let's talking go. about it. You've, you've opened the, the can of worms. Now. This is like the worst day of my life. Okay. Like that's. This is probably what I get my flashbacks on. <laughs> um, <laughs> We were out like on the training area and like we were all, we, we had to go from like one area of the training area back to our, like where we'd set our camp up and the training team were like, right lads, you've got like 10 minutes or whatever. So we were obviously like pegging it. And then all the lads sort of like stopped into like a bottleneck to go down this little path. And I was like, lads, what are you doing? Just jump down here. And there was like this ledge and I was just like, it's just muddy down there, but just jump down to it. So I've just gone, I literally said, lads, what are you doing? Just jump down here. I jumped down up to my freaking <laughs> neck. <laughs> Up to my neck, <laughs> swear down. Up to my neck in bog. Right, my weapon is completely but, submerged. What's bog? Like freaking like pooey, mud. crappy mud. Like up to my neck, not no exaggeration. I love to see the photo of that. I, oh, thankfully, I don't have it. I've got obviously the whole troop is just what crying. I'm like, lads, what are you doing down here? Jump in, lads, get me out! And everyone's <laughs> laughing their heads off. All I'm, all I'm envisioning, I've seen that clip of the vicar of Dibley where she jumps yeah the in the paddock <laughs> mate it's literally like that it's literally like that but I've got a weapon as well so my weapon like they have to drag me out by like my straps up here <laughs> Air, like lads what, are like on the floor people ragging you out yeah like lads are on the floor like howling like they're literally oh. like and I've I've obviously like I'm like I'm like dead where are your serious. arms I was on, I, my whole thing was under the bottom. You can get your arm, arm At up. least your head no. didn't go under. No, so I, I must have landed like here. So I think mm. my, maybe my shoulders were free. But my arms, everything was under because I just like jumped in and my weapon was under. 
there's um, no one anyone doing anything to because I would have been like tickling uh, <laughs> you know, <somewhere. laughs> obviously <laughs> thankfully I had like a time dis- uh, restraint to get back <laughs> otherwise I would have been like absolutely uh, ridiculed but like lads were lads were on the floor laughing a couple of the older lads probably dragged me out uh, how did you like, how did you clean your weapon well this is where it went bad because I obviously now now I'd know right find a, a, the nearest puddle or whatever and jump in and wet myself down but like uh, this was week like 14 and I made a big mistake and I like chucked all my kit into a bag, put my dry. So we have this thing called wet and dry. Yeah. So you only wear your wet gear in the day. When you get into your sleeping bag, you put your dry kit on. When you come out your sleeping bag, you put your wet gear back on. And like obviously, obviously if it, we, were, we were at points we were having to crack our trousers open because they were frozen over to put our legs back in having come out of our sleeping bag. Do you only have one, two pairs of pants? You only, you only take two pairs out, yeah. For 36 weeks, you've got two pairs of pants. So like when you go out in the field, like when we're away from camp for like I say a week long, you'd only take two pairs of trousers, two two tops, and so you swap them. It's like life-saving drills. Yeah. But I'm an idiot at this point. I've panicked. I've gone, I'm completely like, I've got boggy clothes. <laughs> so I've put them in the bottom of my Bergen. Even talking about it now is like, you're such an idiot. <laughs> Um, and put my dry kit on that night at like 3 a.m. We got marched down to the river, thrown in. <gasps> Obviously, I've got my dry kit on. So, uh, when I come back, my bergen is thrown everywhere, all my kits out. My my uh, troop boss is like, Whose freaking kit is this holding my boggy clothes up? I was like, Oh my days. <laughs> I was like, and He goes, and he was so angry, so angry. He's like, I'm going to put your head through this Land Rover. And I was just stood there like, I am done for. It was peeing it down as well. So for the next three days, I had like wet gear and I almost, almost went down. Now I say, I say, I have never really spoken about this like um, publicly Mm -hmm. because it's such bad drills. But being completely honest, that, that was the week that changed everything for me. Up until that point, I was quite mentally weak. I was physically really fit and stuff like that. Mentally weak and I would crumble in situations like this. That day, I remember going, I'm never going to allow myself to do a mistake like this again or allow myself to get into this situation again. And that's where I really started to become a, a Royal Marine from that point on. Um, but it's, you know, I might get ridiculed for that or whatever. I don't care. That's my, that's what happened to me. And uh, and that was the changing point for me. I where I started those, wow. those experiences are good though because we never, if you would have had a perfect how many weeks and months, what you would have learned from that experience versus getting some things wrong is mm. far more valuable. The marathon prep I just did, we did a, a talk about the other day. It went terrible at the end because I got injured. But mm. if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have learned half as much if everything went perfect. We never, and that's the thing as human beings, we often get wrong and we view failure in a very different way is that by those things going wrong, you're one building the, that mental callus that you would have built to, to think, no, fuck this, I'm not going to feel like this again. And then two, you're, you're learning to think outside the box and think on your feet of, of what's the next step, what's the next action I've got to take because something's gone wrong. And if you never have anything go wrong in your life, you're just going to live in this bubble yeah. of thinking that nothing ever goes wrong. And then when some things do go wrong, like I'm talking major shit later in life, you've got to deal with death, yeah, injury, finance, whatever it is. You, you've never got any experience of things really going wrong to, to kind of recall and reflect on. Yeah, very true. And, that, and I use that as a reference point to this day where I go, I'll never allow myself to be do such a stupid decision or such like a, yeah, just like a really irresponsible thing to do. And it came down to basically just comfort. I was like, I, I want comfort, I want warm, dry clothes on, whereas actually the right thing to do would have been to submerge myself, wash myself down and that. But I remember like I was a bit of a mess that day for those couple of days. And you look up to like your training team who are taking you through training and teaching you and you think, I can never get to their standard. Like these guys are so far ahead of me. And one of my corporals just come up to me and goes, don't worry, I was a, I was a mong in training as well. <laughs> <laughs> a mong as well. <laughs> and, I, and like, obviously I was like, that's a dub, that's like a, you know. It's not a compliment. A, a bit of a slap in the face, but it was also goes, it also made me go, oh, okay, so I'm not like like he's obviously in my opinion like a super soldier or whatever yeah. but he's just told me he was a bit of a mong as well so I was like okay that's good that makes that me there, yeah. <laughs> yeah and yeah so just from that week week 14 2009 everything changed for me <laughs> with with that many lads being in camp in the bunks together and all the different places that you were 
there must be some experiences and stories that you have from pranks and things Mate, and stories. So good. Yeah. It's Did you not so, get shouted what, at? What, what type of things happen? What were like some of the things that would happen in terms of like th- people playing tricks on each other or pranks that would happen in? Ah, uh, um, it's, it's it's almost like I'm trying to think of a specific moment, but it's just the when you've got like f- so you start with sixty lads, finish with twelve, but you like when you've got like that many lads together, it's just. The, as you can imagine, the comrade because they, well, there's, when there's five lads together, to exactly, <laughs> you're like school kids again. Yeah, and there's no, there's, there was no women at the time, so no one's trying to be like the big guy. I think this is one of the problems we're going to have is like men change around women. You know, men try and be alphas and stuff like that in front of women. Whereas when there's no women there, lads are just chilled and like you know, there's I, I saw very little arguing, very little like no one. I've never really don't think I've ever really seen a fight within the Marines, which is crazy when you think of the sort of mm-hmm. guys who go in. Uh, it's just banter, like pure banter all the time. I can't. It's, I should have come prepared with a story, but obviously <laughs> I'll, I, I'll, let, I'll let you think about it anyway. But that's it's interesting that you should say that because Cal, for example, went to you went to a mixed school, didn't you, Cal? Yeah. Yeah, and I went to an all all guys school, and we were the same. There was there wasn't. I mean, there was fights, of yeah. course. And but every day I went into school just feeling kind of chilled, relaxed, yeah. mm-hmm. because in the presence of you wanting to show off, and probably the main reason that guys show off is because they want to be the alpha male and yeah. ultimately have sex with an, a, another woman. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, putting it black and white, yep. just taking away all the the complexity of it, and going into school where or sixth form of college where it was just guys. We just used to play football, talk about stupid shit yep. and, and piss around and play play pranks and stuff on each other. Yeah. Where, got... Whereas obviously, Carl, you went to a mixed school, didn't you? I could imagine that. The, 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 not I'm not saying, by the way, because there's females there, they are the cause issue. I'm sure for both genders, having the mixture there can cause more potential issues mm. sometimes. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when you're growing up, obviously in the real world, there's a mixture of men and women. So it's 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 potentially like insulating people. But when you're like thir- like 11 to 18, there's definitely a um, like a tendency to just act up and be the, the big guy around yeah. like, you know, girls. And it's, mm. yeah, probably a better way of educating, I think, is to kind of segregate the boys and girls. But then obviously you're probably a bit less experienced in yeah. interacting with the opposite sex but- when you're like that. Mm. Benefits and disadvantages to both. Yeah, I went to an all-girls school. It was brilliant. Is it the same thing though? Like even at that age when you're like 13, 14, 15, girls stop wearing makeup. Fuck, I, I was a swimmer. I went with my hair wet, wasn't bothered, didn't want to impress any guys. There's no guys there to impress. Yeah. So I, I really, I enjoyed going to It just all. takes that pressure off, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, I or, believe so. Yeah, and like like you say, at that age, you're a bit unsure of yourself and you're yeah. trying to be confident, but actually going through puberty like, and it's yes. all, you don't really know yeah. what's going on. So from personal experience, I think. Well, some people used to take the piss out of our school. I think it was someone from, from your school, Carlo came up to me and went, oh, but you wank each other off in the change. I was like, mate, you're in the lads' changing rooms as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And anyway, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You, haven't got mixed, you haven't got mixed changing rooms. We might, well, probably Pro- do now. Probably now, yeah. but yeah. yeah. So that's a different story though. Oh, I'd love that. Like, That'd be a different podcast. Back, back then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, going back to the story I had, like, so obviously the kit is like, you got a hundred pounds on your back and right. So you're, we're out for a, we're about to go out for a week. Um, so you're going out into the field for a week. You've got all your kit and that. A lad got out into the field uh, so, and like where we're setting up like our, our camp or whatever opened his bag and someone had put an iron in his bag <laughs> <laughs> extra weight yeah but no yeah he's got a freaking he's got to carry his iron around with him for the whole week so he's like oh because he can't so, just like leave it behind yeah well what you can do you can't just like leave a freaking iron like even if we left the wrapper like they'd go mad at us like you can't don't leave wrapper because it leave, it makes you traceable if he left Close. an iron behind it'd be uh Bollocks. <laughs> so he had to carry his freaking iron around for a week like there's just crap like that going on all around like it's quite a serious environment but also like yeah it's little bits and like that. so yeah oh my god did you have, ever have any experiences or interactions when you were in the job with american marines yeah so i i've been out to america for quite a few times to work with the americans um i like i i mean if i had it my way i'd live in america i love it i love i love america yeah i love how like positive and everything if they do something they do it big and mm. like i just like their attitude Full send. yeah yeah that we call it here like oh that's cheesy whereas i'm like no that's freaking class i yeah. love that 
Um, so I like the Americans. Uh, and it's crazy, yeah. So we're out in the California desert, 29 Palms. Um, we're quite reserved, British. Like we're living in these little like metal shell scraper things, a freaking crap. And then literally out of nowhere, this massive convoy, I think it was the USMC, massive convoy of like, I don't know, a hundred trucks pulls up into this big desert space. And within like 20 minutes, they had created an entire camp. Like where like, I don't, I didn't watch how they'd done it, but I think their like vehicles open up into like buildings or something like that. Cause all of a sudden it's like the flip, there's like a literal camp there that was, it was just an empty desert. So I'm like, I lo- like, I love that sort of stuff. They just freaking throw, <laughs> throw money at stuff like that. They just have way, way more kit. Yeah, they've just got, they've got the money, man. They've got the money so they can do like, I'd say, and again, no disrespect to the, to the Americans because like I, like I say, I love them. They're our, ally, our closest allies. I'd say because we don't have the resources they have, our train has to be like freaking on point. Yeah. Whereas because they've got the money, they can sort of like, you know, they're, they're, their weapon systems or, you know, whatever it is, it seems to be normally far superior. Like the, the vehicles they use and stuff. Like we'd have like Land Rovers from like 1970 and stuff. And they've got vehicle houses. <laughs> yeah, literally. they got like Humvees and like, yeah. But yeah, I like I like working with them. Um, just quickly, Sam. Yeah. Speaking about Americans, um, how was it for you as um, somebody in the UK looking back at Afghanistan in August last year? when the Americans pulled out and then really quite mm. quickly um, the Taliban kind of took over. Oh, mate, like I, that, I, that, that was really emotional, like more emotional than I thought it would be. Um, because like you think like, and I think from the, 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 if you think of like the Afghan women and children, like they, before we got there, they were very much like, like I went, like one time we went to a compound and, we went into one room and there was like literally like 10 women in there. That's like one bloke's wives. We had to turn away. We weren't allowed to look at them um, because we're like infidels or whatever. And like, they're literally just like, you're, they're caged animals. Like from, from the West point of view, like I was just like, they're caged animals. We're ch- girls aren't, weren't allowed to go to school. We built schools. Girls were allowed to get education, stuff like that. And then as soon as we left, all of that stuff started getting reversed again. So I don't think girls uh, now can go to school. So imagine, right, so there's a little Lucy out in Afghan who is 12 years old. She's been able to go to school since she was six. But now, as of last year, she's not allowed to, not allowed to anymore. Like, for me, it was crap like that. I was just like, all that work we'd done um, and and also the Afghan people had done to to liberate and free themselves has just been completely thrown thrown away. Like, I suppose that's even more difficult to swallow for you because some of those things that we I've never heard of stuff like that. So for you to be there experiencing those positive changes happening firsthand and making those inroads to then fit to reverse. It's horrendous, mate. And like you think of the lads we've served with and my corporal from training is a triple amputee. Um he's got one arm left. And you think all that, all that ground secured, lives changed and you know, people people say whatever they want. Like on our YouTube we get I get a lot of stick for being in the military and stuff. But I saw the positive stuff that come out of that country. I've seen it first hand. Like I've seen women's lives change, children's lives change. So for me, I was out there do- doing that, like seeing that change, and that was enough for me. And to know that that stuff's been reversed, is f- freaking like I've got three daughters, obviously. So mm-hmm. for me, I like it makes me so uh, uh, upset and angry to see how it was just given back um, and the lives lost and <laughs> just the waste. What else surprised you when you were over there in terms of the everyday life? Um, that I guess one one of the big things was like we often we're all you know I I want the big, best car I want the biggest house I want the best job with the littlest work as possible <laughs> like mm. that's that's the dream in it you know and like actually their lives are really simple but they see, a lot of them seem really, like the kids especially are really happy like those kids are happy kids. Um, I think it's where where wears them down maybe as they get older, but the kids are just really really happy kids when you look at like their kids mm-hmm. compared to our kids, and just the simple lives they live and actually how li- like f- liberating that is. I know they're in a war zone, or well, they were in a war zone and stuff, but like it was amazing. We we would always when we went out on our patrols, we'd fill our pockets with like chocolates and stuff because the kids would run up to us and we'd you know give them chocolates and stuff, and um, that was lovely to see. So I think um, obviously in their their family unit seem to be 
a lot closer than ours, mm. I guess, like in general. Um, but then obviously as well, they were in a war zone, so mm. their lives were very hard as well. So, yeah, I guess that, mate, to be honest. But they were very receptive to... S- mm, some, <laughs> some. Up to the age of 12, and then there's like a change. Mm-hmm. And I think they're suspicious. And I, you imagine, right, they've see, they've probably yeah. seen more than we could ever imagine over that period of time. And um, what one sort of experience I had of that was a, a, a kid, like, that we had a helo helicopter in the air, like, flying around. And he, like, tapped me in and, and, like, pointed to the helo and just went, with no sound, you know, it like, and so he knows just, what just that thing's expo- for. Just explain what you did then, just for people who aren't watching. So like, uh, pointed to the helicopter, pointed a gun to his head, and then just like, died. But the thing that I found like, r- just sort of took me back a little bit, it was like, if you said to a kid in this country, like, right, show me how you'd die if you got shot, they'd go like, oh, and like play yeah. around a little bit. Whereas he knew, if you get shot in the head, yeah. there's no sound, yeah. like you're just dead. And he like knew wow. that, you know, and like, yeah. it's like flipping heck. Like, what are these kids? What have these kids seen? The zero censorship. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Sorry, that's really deep, isn't it? Yeah. When yeah. you, yeah, because our they do it in plays and yeah, it's all like, dramatic, uh, and it's and like they've seen Hollywood and yeah, like getting shot like twelve it's... times before they die. Whereas this kid knows one bullet in your, your and your brown bread, and also knowing exactly where to shoot yeah. yourself to die. Yeah. Awful. Mm. I don't know if you ever ever saw any while you were out there or whether that's had any influence on how you feel where your mindset and mental health was around seeing dead bodies. Like I saw quite a few in the police. Yeah. It, did, it didn't really have a massive impact on me, but that it, it's very different to obviously what I was seeing. I wasn't seeing uh, people who had been shot or uh, really anyone who had died of unnatural cause, I suppose you'd, you'd yeah. say. Um, no, to be honest, I, no, it was fine. Like, yeah, as bad as that sounds, you're there, you, you got a job to do and you are just very single minded and you're just, uh, yeah, we had one, one time where like the Afghan national army soldiers just dropped a load outside, just, yeah, just dropped a load outside our compound and was just like Taliban and just drove in and you're like, okay, like. This is freaking weird, but you you know you you've that you've been geared up to go out there. You've signed up, obviously, the whole way through, like Royal Marines training. You know that this is going to be where you end up and stuff. And I think it's just a bit like part and parcel of of the job, so to speak. Mm. Obviously, if I walked through it past a dead body like here, it'd probably take me back. But yeah. out there, you sort of you're in that zone. So the theory is very different to practice though, isn't it? Because I remember when I was going to, you call it a sudden death in the police. I remember, because I had to go to one to as part of my training to get it, it ticked off that you'd be able to deal right, with that okay. situation. Oh, interesting. I remember going to my first one, I was like, just like in the car, like, it was hot, I was just going. Yeah. Just so nervous about just seeing a body not alive. Yeah. It was just, felt surreal because like I'm not supposed to see this. What was it like? It was quite flat and eerie. I didn't really feel anything. I think the good the, th- the good thing for me, but obviously in that situation, was that there was people from I think it was the morgue who came, and the people who have lost anyone. It might be quite comforting is that the people who come from the morgue treat the body like it's alive speaking to it like i'm just gonna move you here darling just gonna take really? this off yeah well and i think that's maybe also a comp- coping mechanism for them but also all public perception in terms of family were in in the house when i went to mm. the body so it's a nice thing from 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 both perspectives but they just treat it like she was alive um chat i'm gonna move you here i'm gonna do this now almost like she just injured rather than dead and i think that really created an environment and a space where it made everyone feel comfortable in an uncomfortable situation mm. that makes sense which is obviously very different to the the circumstance and the environment you would have been I'm guessing yeah I, and I think as well like our society is try to remove death from it hasn't it I guess like it's you know in, in like times gone by it would have just been around you like yeah. quite normal and stuff whereas now we've um I don't want to be like disrespectful but it's almost like dramatized like like death is like this massive deal um and it is but it's also like 
all five of us or four, four of us can be dead like in within the next like we you're we 25 20, so yeah let's I just maybe, say 100 years <laughs> <laughs> i think that's maybe because we see stuff in the movies and stuff yeah. though and it's massively built up to be this yeah. yep. the thing and there's death looks a lot scarier probably than especially if it's natural causes yeah with what you do now with complete commander it's oh, like yeah. your t-shirt i'll ask you about that more in a sec but do you gear people up for that sort of thing as in you're going to see a dead body this is how you should prepare no so i i know where my boundaries are with yeah, complete commando right. i don't step on the royal marines or the military's toes so i literally i will talk like so we do like um member q and a's and stuff and I, I don't go too much detail like with operations and things like that because i just uh it's just not really like what i do but like um i will i'll tell them like lads this is everyone glorifies the military this is the potential of what you're going into like mm. you might go and lose a limb you might die you know like this is the you've got to really consider these things before joining don't let it put you off like but think about it first mm -hmm. but yeah I, I i know where my position is in this whole thing of like getting people fit for the military and sort of preparing them mentally for maybe what they're going in and answering the questions that are unanswered by the military uh, before joining and then once they're in my hands are, are off those guys and girls what made you want to do that um well obviously i was a pt um i was thinking this but the other, uh, earlier as well like i i met you first at do you remember the deadlift competition at empowered yeah oh my god and that you'd was like just five come on the scene with ago. ben yeah yeah about five was years it ago deadlift party yeah deadlift party yeah. and you weren't dating at the time no nope. Uh, yeah, it was interesting. I just think about it the other day. Yeah. Um, many, well, many years ago. Many yeah, many years ago. ago yeah, 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 five years ago. But there was there was a little twinkle in his eye. I know. <laughs> that's <laughs> what the effect I had on him. <laughs> um, so yeah, so congratulations as well. She got she getting engaged. Indeed. Engaged, didn't you? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Thank you. I was gonna. I know this is off topic, but what is the what's your surname gonna be? Halden. Yeah. Is it? Cool. I did cool. I did like Davis Halden, but Ben did not like Davis yeah, Halden. Yeah, yeah. I also think double barrel, like I don't I don't need to double barrel. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. more so I've got a sister and the Davis, D A V I S will die. And that makes me sad. Oh uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Because I've got a sister. Unless Megan decides to keep Davis, but I don't think she How will. How old's your parents? Fifty eight. One more, do you reckon? Like, <laughs> <laughs> just keep the David's name and squeeze the one out. Get a baby brother, got yeah. land up yeah. with another, another girl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah. yeah well, I've got no. three daughters. My brother's yeah. got three daughters. There's four four boys. We've got six wow. girls. So I'm like saying to Elrique, my wife Elrique, I'm like... Squeezing the one in? Oh, like, it'll be a girl. I'm like Henry VIII. It'll be, <laughs> it'll be a girl. Um, what were we talking about there? Sorry. We were talking about... Oh, why did I want to do it? Basically, yeah, what you do it, now? It was in response to COVID. So I had my PT business at Empowered Fit. I was doing, you know, relatively well with that. Then overnight, I remember literally being on a platform with, with someone teaching them deadlifting. They got a phone call and they went, um, I'm going to have to go. I've just lost my job because of COVID. And I was like, I was like, what the heck? I was like, this thing's because I'd like, I was like, yeah, COVID, all right. Like, I think most people were. Yeah. And it was in that moment I went flipping heck and literally almost overnight i lost half my business and um i, I wasn't going to just sit and get government payouts i was like i'm, I'm going to do something so like like you said earlier i started with a youtube video like sort of sat there like hello guys i'm going to teach you five things you need to get ready for the royal marines proper such an awful video um and yeah from there i just started getting questions about fitness and stuff and i was like oh maybe i put a program together i had sort of like rough targets of what i wanted to hit in the first sort of six months and those like within a month i had like my six month targets i think something like that within six months we had oh yeah about six months we had 700 members wow. on our on online fitness programs i was like wow what the heck um and so like i i i had all these members and i had no infrastructure i was like what is going on here so i had to backtrack on myself and stuff like that and add new programs and Things like that. It's just been... I, I think that's still good a, a good way to do it, though. By the way, like I speak to a lot of business mentors who will advocate doing it that way. It's better to sell the product and the service and then build out from there because loads of people come in with this all singing, all dancing, yeah. spent thousands of pounds on a product and have nobody yeah. to sell it to. Yeah, you're right, mate. Yeah, I did get a bit 
confident like within a year i i was like apparel we're getting apparel i sp- went and spent like probably seven grand on <laughs> apparel and then got it printed separately and i was like oh yeah and like sold like freaking three <laughs> three in the first month i was like oh and then like it's like just dragging yeah. itself out so i was like i got a bit confident i learned loads from yeah. that and um yes yeah, this has been an incredible journey i've learned so much from business and stuff like that and i yeah i'm fully online now so i don't pt i pt one lady my friend who's a royal marine's mum oh she's a bit of a mum to me so she enjoy that. doing it yeah i enjoy that so yeah just everything else is online and are you specifically gearing people up to join the royal marines that's what it is like this is the training it, it's not just like general it wouldn't be like me for example um or- so yeah it's all about the military royal marine specifically and then loosely the, the the military as a whole um i am thinking right how can i maybe broaden this but i also don't want to lose my usp Finish, yeah. mm, so i'm on my youtube now i'm like i'm going to go and train with some like pro a bit like what you've done like where you go around and you um, i'm going to do a little bit of that where some call it like royal marine v pro boxer yeah and i'm basically yeah. going to go to like a, a boxer's gym and he's going to like i just said to him thrash me like make me make me cry yeah and do a bit more like that and go to different mainstream sports and um the idea behind that is i've got the tagline it goes like this <clears throat> My name's Sam. I know what it takes to be an elite soldier, but now I've turned my attention to be an elite athlete. I'm going to be going around the world to put myself against some of the best ge- athletes of this generation. And so it'd be like that. So I I'm just going that. around, just going, it. thrash me. <laughs> I'll watch it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it is. Really, yeah, really, really good idea. Because I, I absolutely, that whole day was amazing. I said to Ben, he should just go and try as well and do exactly what I did and see yeah. if he can like beat my time. Well, I did as well. We could swap days. So like, I'll, you put me through your training and I'll put you through a bit of mine or whatever. Um, oh, you're, you'd hate it, you know, Ben. Well, this, I think the thing <laughs> is anyway, in, in terms of like broadening the horizons of it, I think it's still got sex appeal to say like people generally in the fitness industry do 12 week programs to try and get in shape. I think having a 12 week program, which is like, this is going to be geared around what we do as a, as a commando. And at the end of it, you're, you're going to be fit, yeah, healthy, perform well. and But this is going to be the process that we get there. So the, the end product is still the same, or if not better. Yeah, but yeah. it's just giving people the opportunity to experience training in a different way geared towards the same end goal. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so we do like their nutrition. Like So they get like a, a questionnaire at the start and I sort their nutrition out. Every week they get like a nutrition. I think nutrition is the biggest thing for me. It was only something I sort of learned the last five years. I always got away with just eating whatever I wanted because we were training so hard. Mm. Now I got a bit older and, you know, got a couple of kids and stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's just like, what the heck? Like getting chubby here. And so just so- something I l- learned a lot more as a PT. And I think that's the sort of hidden, the the missing part for a lot of people. Like a lot of people can go and train and beast themselves and stuff like that. But they- their nutrition's a bit like, I mean, as you guys know, like freaking people make millions out of, confusing people about nutrition like yeah. i know that's a lot of your guys what you deal with and you're, you're the experts of that so we do we deal with that also it's like an ongoing program so it's like um it's basically a periodized program i've put together they test that they do tests every eight weeks and then based off those tests the program adapts to them to their levels and stuff like that with that's, with, hey, that's stuff. So so clever. with the running and and things like that so um so yeah, it's just it goes on so it's just a direct debit and they cancel it when they're ready to 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 join. Oh, um, that's amazing. You must feel really proud. Yeah, well. like, but but like I, I you you almost never satisfied, are you? I was like yeah. I need to change the brand, I need to get oh the logo, yeah. I need to how can I expand and stuff like that. And and going back to what we said earlier, just actually looking around and being content with like, you know, like I can pick my kids up every day from school. I'm there for ho- for bedtime with them and, you know, some amazing little wins every day that I'm getting. And sometimes I'm too focused on like, oh, I need to grow the business. So. Yeah. There's there's different rewards from different things as part of business or life. I remember, I can't remember if you remember what they were, Cal. I think it was, I've heard these four before. I think it, you were saying it's from like a Jap- Japanese philosophy or something in terms of th- things that, as human beings we find rewarding. I don't know if you can pull that up. Yeah, I can't. Uh, I I was trying to find it the other day, but it's essentially like the four areas of life that you want uh, in order to get like maximum fulfillment. So it's like what society needs, it's what you need personally, it's what you're good at, and what you can make financial 
okay. gains from. And if you can get something which ticks all four boxes, mm, then yeah. there's a term for it. I'll see if I can find that. I'll answer it if I can. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's what you should be aiming for. Amazing. Interesting. I mean, think about it. You know, yeah, just, yeah. You're just in one box. The other thing I wanted to ask you was, how different do you think your view and passion for the military may have been if it wasn't a choice and it was a draft? The reason I ask that is mm. because I don't know if you've seen what's happening in Russia at the moment where they've gone back to cons- it's called conscription. Yeah. Um, and that hasn't happened obviously since like the 60s. And it's obviously happened for a lot of people in Russia who don't even support the war and don't want to fight and don't want to die for their country. Well, I was made to go to school for 16 years. I think people should be made to do the military for two years, <laughs> personally. Like, I think um, that with no context, that's a mental answer, isn't it? So <laughs> just, Cal, just clip that one piece for 10 seconds, that will get views, mate. Everyone, views, yeah. <laughs> like, it, we'd have no chavs, would we? We'd have no. We would have a lot less uh, crime and a lot like people taking ownership of their lives and discipline would be instilled. I'm really like I. I had a solid mum and a really solid dad, so I had like an element of discipline. I was obviously at a club where discipline was instilled. Obviously, you had your swimming and um, I don't. I obviously don't know what you was doing as a kid. Um, but yeah. what, I did when I left school, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I was wanting to be a football player, yeah. so broke, you, broke my leg, and then wanted to pursue a career in the police. So you had that structure of like football and, Sport. you know, something to keep your eye. A lot of people don't have that. And they're at, they're at home with an Xbox or whatever. And like, um, they don't have parents who push them to go and try new things and stuff like that. So um, two years in the military, I'm not saying go and join the Royal Marines, but like some sort of like, thing where it just instills discipline it still instills self-respect instills like habits and fizz like exercise and i think that'd be amazing amazing thing um but i think there would be like maybe things where if you're already on the path like you know if you're an elite athlete or you're definitely doing a degree for a purpose or, or whatever it is then obviously there'd be like maybe things that you wouldn't go into but i think for a lot of people it'd be an amazing thing to do this is gonna sound super harsh mm. and this is a question that i've he- heard before and it's not my view but i want to put it to you yep do you think that the army navy whatever it is is for people who don't see any future in anything else they're maybe yeah. lacking in terms of experience knowledge and to some degree are a dropout yeah, I'd say that's a it's a really good net for people like that. Like my oldest brother might not met, like me. Well, he might. I don't, it doesn't matter. He basically was ordered at sixteen. You're either going down like the juvenile route or you join join the military. So join the navy. But he's he's a really good testament to that. He's like thirty six now. Had an incredible career. Lives out in Germany as the navy ski instructor, and his job is to teach skiing and climbing and canoeing. Wow. And he's on a good wage very solid like diligent guy and his life's completely changed whereas if he hadn't joined the military probably i don't know where it'd be like but he was a bit of a muppet as a kid and so he he's a good testament to that i'm a good testament to it that yeah i i'm not afraid to I, you know i'm not scared to say that i had no prospects after football it's like what am i what's a lad like me gonna do um and the military was a sort of last last resort but from the military like look at the stuff i've been able to do um, even to be a good dad and to be, you know, all those stuff I attribute to the mili- to my military service. So, um, yeah, it is a it is a good net for people with no prospects. Definitely. Tell you didn't work for Jeffrey Dahmer. Who's that? You not seen the oh, Netflix know. documentary? Oh, one, no, mate. No. You need to watch it. Have you seen Everyone it? Everyone's telling me to watch mate, this. It's fucking. Br- I mean, I did a, I did a lot about him in criminology, so I knew the okay, whole story. Yeah, yeah. Now, but then I watched the Netflix series, and it's a it's a really good series. To be fair, and the the guy who plays Jeffrey Dahmer is brilliant as well yeah brilliant but yeah, yeah he, he got he, yeah his dad Weird. made him go to was he in the army he was in the army he was in the army and just he didn't work it just did yeah he, was, he, he was, as well. we don't want to give it away though yeah yeah okay. it, like insane yeah. you'll have to watch it okay there's a lot of things that went on through his childhood as well though don't I give think. it away ben i'm not i'm just saying but watch it yeah, yeah. good to give us your verdict i would say that like you'd probably look to have a, a separate service for like a two-year conscription conscription or whatever yeah. it's called um 
I'm ugh, see I'm old school. I just think like everyone should do a bit of not everyone, but like a lot of people when you see like chavs outside you, know, you look outside your house and there's a bunch of chavs and you're like freaking go and join the military or something like and that's why sports great as well though, yeah, isn't it? yeah 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 all that stuff's great like anything where it puts puts you to your limits and tests you and gives you discipline and structure and a reward like it's great i think you know the tv adverts where it's like join the military yeah. join the, i think they're they're geared up to those people. I feel like they're speaking to those sort of people. I don't know where it's like. And the marketing's clever behind not, all those things. Yeah. If you're not satisfied, if you're not doing what you want with your life, join the military. Like the way they word and market those TV ads, I think it is for. At the that well, that's of, what I hear when I listen mm -hmm. to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't listen to it and think, oh, I'll do that. Yeah. But I, there'll be some people who listen and think, do you know what? They're speaking to me. Yeah, I and remember sitting clever. in the cinema probably around like 17, 18 and a Royal Marines advert come up and it's a guy like the music's all eerie, a guy like walk, a, a Royal Marine going through like a, a pond or whatever. And then have you seen it? And this guy I think I've comes seen out yeah. and he like turns and he's like, it's like he's been caught out and then all of a sudden like 10 Royal Marines pop up and the, the, the enemy is like, oh crap. And you're like, Oh yeah, that looks freaking yeah. sick. Now I know from experience the guy going through the pond would have in his head he'd be going for flip's sake, my boots are wet now for the next <laughs> week. But like as a as a young lad like in a cinema with again sort of no prospects or whatever going forward, you go, Yeah, that's badass. Yeah. I wanna do that, like, you know. And I the in answer to your question uh, at the start of the podcast about the women join the Royal Marines, I think the the women who are probably gonna would pass Royal Marines training are probably elite athletes. Yeah. Yeah. Why the heck are they gonna join the Marines? Yeah. You know, like that yeah, they're all yeah. They're already the level good of fitness that or, you need yeah. is high. I don't even know if I would pass. Well I think you if you focus you've done a hundred K run and then freaking what are you doing now like a, de a bench press world yeah. record or whatever yeah you, you've got that mindset if Brit anyone's gonna British pass British record not well, well pff, okay British record <laughs> <laughs> Chester record and also <laughs> tested <laughs> tested okay. federation there yeah. we go so like that's the sort of mindset of like you know mm, yeah but 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 yeah it's gonna be freaking hard but because... it is you you would have to get to an elite I've, I've been an elite athlete I've it's yeah. very true point yeah yeah or you have to be at some sort of level of yeah, Sport. and then also weight. You've got to have a certain amount of weight. If you're 64 kilos, mm. putting a hundred hundred pounds on your back plus a 23 kilo no, GPMG so for 30, 40 miles, like what's going to happen? Like you're going to fall over after like two. But they're, yeah. they're the circumstances where a quality of opportunity has always got to be the forefront, not the yeah, not the. Um, well, that's why all the, 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 the quality the of outcome because yeah. that would just be a disaster. But mm. the the problem I see going forward is politicians are going to start going in two three years time. Why have no females got through Roman training? Like this has to change. Mm -hmm. Like no, this has to change. So like, then it's like there's a lot of pressure on the the military to start changing systems. Like you see all the time, don't you? Stuff like, like that, yeah. But yeah. that just wouldn't be fair. It wouldn't. I don't think the the sense. women that are attracted to it want that either. They no. want to test themselves. Yeah, yeah like, absolutely. To the, that's why the police doesn't appeal to me because I'm like, I could do a bleep test backwards. Mm -hmm. If it was right, bleep test is level fifteen. I'll go. Oh, I want to freaking give that a go, yeah. you know? And I think uh, they're losing a lot of people like that because it's not a challenge. Mm. So I think they're kicking themselves in, in. I don't know what the expression is, kicking themselves in. In the teeth. In the teeth, it? yeah. Why, why do you think war or the armed forces seems sexy to to guys? Do you think it's with just glorify the movies and, and media? Or what? what is it that you think is in with, like, like you've seen, you saw, you saw the advert and you're like, wow. It seems cool. What do you think it is mm. innate or built into guys? Or what do you think, why do you think that kind of image or that feeling comes about? I think being a hero, every young boy or like 99% of young boys want to be a, some, a hero, don't they? Like they want to rescue a beauty. They want to be the hero. They want to, you know, like if you look at the films we love, Taken's my favorite film. He like, you want to be Liam Neeson. He's a hero. He goes and rescues his daughter, gladiator. You've got this guy like who's like, put into slavery and he like comes out and he's like the the man i think like james bond sorry james bond yeah there. like the, he's the, a cool the, guy yeah he's a cool guy. and the, the films that guys um traditionally like it, it all has that sort of like hero element to it and i guess like the military sort of feels like that's something that you could achieve 
Mm. Like, you know, there's lots of guys who have come out of Afghan who are absolute heroes in my in my eyes and stuff and some of the things they've done, like the Ant Middleton, <laughs> people like that, you know, mm. like obviously and Ant Middleton is just a public figure. There's guys who are just doing normal nine to five jobs now who have done ridiculous things you could never even imagine in terms of bravery and self-sacrifice um but yeah i think it comes down to that like being being a hero making a difference and ha having a life of purpose i think it's quite hard to find that in a lot of jobs in society mm -hmm. you know be, being an accountant is obviously a, you know so a good job but it's like do you get that fulfillment of like i'm making a real difference and like you know if, i don't know I get what you mean because it happens to a lot of people who quit or people who finish in their career of professional sports. They had this real post-depression around yeah. they've lost identity, they've lost purpose from what they were doing at this high level, and now they're going to do something else which doesn't really, yeah, which yeah. doesn't really kind of yeah. fuel the fire that they had there before. The other question I was going to ask on that in terms of the male-female split is: Did you see? Would you call it an officer position? Would you, did you see many um, women fulfilling those? positions well in the marines is only only guys but in the navy RAF, Sorry, yeah army like there is female officers um i experienced it a little bit i was at a base in i was in a naval base for six months in um plymouth we had like female officers and stuff like that um yeah just i didn't ever feel like oh a, a woman's in charge mm -hmm. or whatever, i didn't care like um yeah but they, they definitely feel those roles. Yeah, again, you want that equality. Uh, the quality, uh, Sorry, I'm getting mixed up. The equality of opportunity in those positions because it's not then just determined by level of strength or, yeah, or physicality. Yeah. Mm. Like, because there's some of the most intelligent, compassionate, great leaders who are, who are all women and you want them to be fulfilling those yeah. positions because you want the best person to do that job. My, my videographer, media girl, or, you know, Hayley, I was like, I, I think I want a female for this job because they're normally a lot more like diligent in, in my experience. Mm -hmm. Carl, do you want to speak up or? Yeah, I, I was like, <laughs> as somebody who knows her, yeah, she's probably a million times more diligent and organized than I am. One yeah, <laughs> like, so I was like, I want, I want a female in that role. So I was like, is that positive discrimination? No, it's just from my experience that is, yeah. that w women are better. Than. My wife, wife is so much more organized than me. I'd employ her over me anytime. Yeah. I'm organized. Um, you are. Just a quick one. Uh, you were talking earlier about how um, maybe the military is like appearance quite sexy to young people. Um, and apparently in the United States, every branch of the military now has an esports team. So like a Call of Duty video gaming team. So oh, they wow. are basically like advertising to people that you can, you know, making it appear much more sexy to people. Who, you said earlier, like we wouldn't have chabs if we had conscription. I think a lot of those people might fall under the remit mm. of like video game addicted kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the military's realized that and started to capitalize on it. Well, that's very interesting. So they're basically trying to market to these people who are playing the games. Yeah, yeah. And, so, and they're, they're like a actively advertising. Well, so they're saying like, this is the United States Marine Corps Twitch channel. Oh, Come wow. on and watch us oh, like, wow. beat people on Call of Duty yeah. eight hours a day. And we know how big the, the oh, gaming community is getting. <laughs> oh, my mate, he's a Royal Marine. He's got a, uh, a channel called Glid Gaming. And he's that's that's his USP on YouTube is and he starts the videos with like come and come and do like you know call of duty with a, a real royal marine and stuff yeah, and like right. the drills they do are amazing and stuff like that it's like freaking good to be fair wow this that is very age. clever that more yeah. isn't that a st straight there's not that wild by the way like gaming is so popular now they're targeting yeah and i suppose yeah. if you get that into it that focus that dedicated you give an hour to it the next step the next logical step is to to do the real thing yeah, yeah not definitely. behind the screen yeah. wow one of the things I want to ask you before we close, what advice would you give to someone who's thinking about joining? Seek people who have been there is the biggest thing. I sort of went in, a, I mean, I had my dad and my brother, but they hadn't been Royal Marines. And so I went in, didn't really know what I was doing. Uh, but seek someone like, like that you can uh, reach out to. We're there, complete command if you need us. Mm -hmm. um, and just ask all the questions you can, get all the information you can before sort of, taking that leap because a lot of people get to training get two weeks in and go this isn't for me mm. and it's like well if you'd asked the relevant questions yeah. prior to it then you would have known that like a year ago um and if you are looking to join just really start getting your fizz under wraps and getting good discipline things like waking up earlier um not like binging uh like call of duty till 2 a.m you know start putting structure in your life 
so that when you go, you're already a disciplined, structured person. Mm -hmm. you know, and I think those things are really, really good. Um, seek out good coaches, get some coaching, you know, mm -hmm. especially for things like lifting, get nice and strong and aerobically fit. Um, we haven't really spoke about that. What are the main things you, you realistically need to succeed at in terms of physical? I think aerobic fitness is, is massive. Um, that ability to just go and go. Is there any real metric points that you think, right, this is what you need to be at in order to... So my mile and a half, so mile and a half is a test that they use. My mile and a half time is 8.07, which is quite a good time. Yours. Yeah. Your mine's 8.06, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, 8.05, I meant. Um, <laughs> Uh, I always got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's a good time. So I would look to try and get your mile and a half, like under nine minutes if you join the Marines. I'd yeah. say bleep test. You want to be trying to get as close to 15, that sort of level as possible. So high school, yeah. What's yours on that? Um, yeah, about 15.2, 15.3, something like that. Yeah, mine's about 15.5. Yeah, yeah. I'm, so, yeah. <laughs> I'm not even going to tell you mine because mine just surprised both of you. What is so. it? You mine's 16. Is it? Is it? Yeah. yeah. Scott that's that. class yeah yeah i'll tell you Carl, what did me and <laughs> nick do when we were no me and nick did the bleep test when we were in i'll have a look now i'll let you know before we finish the Lanzia. Oh, you know if it you, you? if it's if you check Carl and it's below lucy and sam just watch. don't mention it yeah <laughs> <laughs> um yeah body weight stuff just get like n nail your pull-ups pull pull press up yeah 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 that's the stuff it, it, numbers again is there anything that you say um, it'd be a good metric to build up to pull-ups i'd say minimum 12 strict with good form uh like as a minimum press-ups within two minutes i'd say minimum like 60 again with good strict form sit-ups 80 in two minutes um i'd say i'm a big believer in building your squat right so if you've got that if you've got that Bergen on your back and your your one rep max squat is 100 kilo and that Bergen weighs mm, 55 kilo, it's going to feel freaking heavy mm -hmm. as opposed to someone with a, a 150 squat or a, a one night. Basically, the higher you meet your squat, the, the lighter that Bergen's yeah. going to feel. Mm -hmm. As long as you're not going into that position where your strength takes away from your aerobic capacity, I'd say a bit work on a, yeah. on a good squat. Um, yeah. Almost carries. Farmers carries, yeah, great. And get out in the elements, man. Like get get in the nitty gritty. Like when it's raining, go out for your runs. Like don't don't wait till the rain rain stops. Like get on the hills if you live near North Wales. Yeah. Get yourself out there. Just get that was the stuff I was weak at because I, I was a little footballer. Like you know, like er, conditions had to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Whereas that the the weather was the thing that really like yeah hurt the unknown. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can't predict it. Yeah, so get out of your 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 gym and go out. Get, get on the hills and i think running in the rain makes you a stronger person yeah really does yeah really does running in the elements running in the wind cold yeah the cold even now i'm like oh need my gloves yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, think, yeah. I think it's good doing those runs out, <laughs> yeah. and that's why i actually like running in the winter it's yeah it, I it's, do. Di it's different you don't you don't want to go out and do it but you need to go out and do the things that you said you were going to do when you don't feel like it yes. and that's what builds or that's what progresses you forward to to progress and move forward into the person that you want to develop yeah. into. Well, we I used to say this, like it's all well and good being sat on your couch watching Save and Private Ryan saying you want to join the Royal Marines, but see if you still want to join it after two days on a windy mountain in, mm -hmm. in Wales. Yeah. Like, you know, because that's where we all want to be the, the superstar, don't we? The difference between us and those top elite athletes is they, they were prepared to do the stuff that we might not necessarily have been prepared mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and obviously politics and ACLs. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> and I'm guessing these are all things that you obviously teach in the complete commando. Yeah, yep. I know, and we're we, we're an open channel on like Instagram. I've got all the time in the world. You know, we we spend a lot of time every day messaging people back. Um, sometimes we can't message straight away because we we get a lot of me like probably sixty messages a day, but we always make sure that we we do eventually reply. So. Um, yeah, if anyone is, does want any in, inf extra information stuff, like our channel's always open. So for on that, that where, where can people find the channels and what they're called? Uh, Complete Commando on Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, Twitter, I think, but I don't use Twitter. Um, and yeah, they're, they're probably the main ones. My, my own Sam Legan Fitness, I've pretty much left left to die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. Cool. Amazing. Carl, did we get my thing? Or did you not mention it because I was worse off. No, so you did the police fitness test, but you stopped when you reached the goal. Oh, wow. that's really poor. Is that the one that me and Nick did in Lanza? Yeah, you just, you didn't go to like, cause it was 
32 degrees in Maserati. You're yeah. Like trying to like kill yourselves. What level was that? Was that level five? I think it was like seven, eight or something like that. It wasn't. Well, yeah. for when we were practicing for the SAS one, we know we needed 10.2. So we always pushed to 11.5. Yeah, I think further. I tapped out at 11.5. Level, level mindset though, isn't it? No. <laughs> and also how fast your feet can, <laughs> can, can go. Uh, do you know what's like? Sorry, I will stop in a sec. You know, it's okay. the bleep test, I would say... And also the 1.5 mile. You're not really sprinting in the Marines, mm. are you? No. Why no, aren't no. people practicing like 10, 15, 20 Ks considering you're walking? A, you know what? It's a good point. Uh, it's, it's something we, we find difficult to program for because we like when you think of aerobic capacity, you're thinking like longer 40 yeah. minute runs and everything in the Royal Marines other than it seems like a mile and a half is like big Bergen's on, go for long mileage. Volume. Yeah. volume in that but the first nine weeks of raw the reason we we program a lot for like the short stuff is the first nine weeks of raw man's training you're in the gymnasium phase mm. where like i say it's, it's sp you're sprinting everywhere mm. camp circuit 800 meter best effort camp circuits and within a, s a session you'll maybe do like you could do up to four or five of those best effort and like you've got people in your face like shouting as you usually go around and stuff like that so we always like to build that element into them and then in Royal Marines training, that's where they start really building like the long mileage mm. into the guy's legs and stuff like that. That makes sense. Yeah. And also as well, like guys are coming onto our training who might not necessarily be, have a big, um, like a, tr a long training age. They might have only trained for a year or so. And so if I start sending them out on like 10 mile runs, you're getting shin spins yeah. and niggles and stuff like that. And that's so it's, it's got to scale. It's got, you can't jump in the deep end and stuff. And one thing I will say on that is, although some of those numbers we've spoken about, if you are looking to join anything or you've got some fitness test coming up is although it might seem daunting at first at those high numbers i remember when i first went out for looking at 5k 10k I was like, you came back from your first 10k i was like oh my god yeah it was like you just you'd run I, around the world yeah. like how'd you feel are you okay do you need to sit down and then it's like you go, you do a 10k and say, oh, it's not that not that bad and yeah. then you do a 20 and you push it further so don't worry if you're at a point currently where your fitness levels or strength levels feel like you're a million miles away mm. it will scale up especially if you get the the right training and the right guidance to do definitely so. mate yep definitely well sam thank you very much for coming on it's been thank you so much been very, it's been a very interesting conversation it's been a great great conversation i think there'll be a lot learned through the conversation especially around it being mental health mm awareness week as well and we will pop all the links in the descriptions youtube video for people to visit those charities if they need to to speak to someone um along the lines as well if you are watching this on youtube please feel free to drop any questions in the box below for either us or for sam we'll try and get an answer in there sure at some point or if you're listening to it continue to tag us on yep. the not so fickle one instagram and complete commando at complete commando yeah and please leave a glowing review in the the podcast description yeah. In podcast review sorry yeah so thank you so much this was no honestly worries, yeah. i felt like we could have talked oh, forever yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. like a part two <laughs> yeah. but no we really really appreciate no your problems, time yeah no thanks very much for having me guys cheers